Good afternoon, everyone. Um, for a little housekeeping matter before we begin, I'd ask anyone on the panel or anyone in the room, if you have a cell phone at this time, please silence your ringer, if you would, please. Um, I am Delegate Terry Austin. I chair the ID1 committee, advisory committee, and I'm also chairman of the House Transportation Committee. Uh, I would like this time to introduce to my right, Secretary Miller, uh, our Secretary of Transportation. Secretary Miller, do you have any opening comments you would like to? <clears throat> Thank address? you, Mr. Chairman. Just pleased to be here in the beautiful part of the, of the country and the, of the Commonwealth. Had not been in the horse center. I've been around it and sort of looked at it from the outside, but never been in. What a fantastic facility it is. And, and um, I understand it's somewhat unique in the, uh, in the uh, United States and um, just great to be here. I will say, as you know, um, the governor has a priority and that he talked about when he was running for governor, it remains with him, um, as to how to make 81 a better route for the citizens of the Commonwealth and particularly those that reside in this area and use it frequently. And so, um, you know, when I was a little kid, it was tennis shoes were much simpler than they are today. It was like Keds and PF Flyers, right? And PF Flyer had the, the, the logo, the, the saying it was, they, uh, you can run faster and jump higher in PF Flyers. And so one of the things we came on board with uh, when we began this journey um, a couple of years ago, as the governor said, how, how can we make 81 run faster and jump higher? How can we make it better faster? And so that's always been a, a goal of his. And part of what we'll look at today is, you know, is look, sees that we, we continue to do and continue to have an effort. We continue to expend it to see how we can make this um, work better um, for everybody in the Commonwealth, but particularly those folks who got to use it on a regular basis. So pleased to be here and look forward to uh, to the presentation. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Secretary. Uh, first, what, let me welcome you to the Virginia Horse Center. Um, I requested to the CEO, Glenn Petty, a good friend of mine who operates this facility, that uh, we have this meeting here in this room. And, and I wanted to do so for two reasons. One, this is going to be in my new House district. If I'm elected in November, the 37th House district will be new to me, this area. But number two, I wanted you all to see and to understand what is here, what Virginia has. Um, there's approximately 600 acres of real estate here with the Horse Center. We have indoor, outdoor rings. We have 734 stalls. We have jump, hunt. Uh, just a tremendous facility. It was built uh, by the Commonwealth of Virginia and then later taken over by Rockbridge County. Um, along with Glenn, the, the person who's helped support this probably the most is uh, County Administrator Spencer Suter, who's here also, along with one of our members, Frank Friedman, the, the city manager of the city of Lexington. So, uh, you know, I, I hope you all, um, and Frank, did I get that right? Is it mayor or city? Mayor. Mayor, I apologize, mayor. Uh, for the city of Lexington. But this is a tremendous facility. We had uh, some people here uh, from Churchill Downs, and while they were here, we toured, they toured the facility, and they said, we have nothing in Kentucky to compare to this. So we should all be very proud of that. Um, great facility. Um, I have welcomed Secretary Miller, along with Secretary Miller, is our commissioner. Commissioner Stephen Bridge to the secretary is right along with Chief Engineer Bart Thrasher. Uh, our program coordinator, Dave Covington is here, Dave sitting over here. And I welcome all of VDOT staff. We appreciate what VDOT does for us. They work hard for us every day. A tremendous amount of highway system within the Commonwealth of Virginia, not just surface transportation, but rail and the spaceport and the Port of Virginia, waterways, many, many facets fall under the Secretary's purview and the Commissioner's purview. So. We very much appreciate what VDOT does for us every day. Uh, the committee is looking forward to reviewing what's been accomplished to date on the ID1 plan and where we stand with future projects and timelines. On the agenda, we will receive a program update from Mr. Covington. We'll also have an opportunity on the ID1 multimodal plan presented by Zach Trogdon, Chief of Public Transportation and the Virginia Breeze and a finance update from Mrs. Laura Farmer, CFO of VDOT. I understand that we're on target with the programs initiated and slated for improvements on I-81, which is good news. I am of the opinion that we must look at all options to improve the progression 
of additional AIM miles, and I look forward to reviewing today's presentation on the P3 study. With that, I will call the meeting to order, and let's begin our business. At this time, I would like to ask the members of the committee to go around the table and introduce yourselves, if you would, please. And Mr. Folks, would you begin, please? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Tom Folks. I live in Washington County, Virginia, and I'm the uh, uh, member of the Virginia, uh, the Commonwealth Transportation Board representing the Bristol District. <laughs> My name is Mark Merrill. I live in Winchester, Virginia. I am the Stanton District representative to the Commonwealth Transportation Board. I'm Randy Pennington. I live in Washington County, Virginia, and I'm a chairman of Mount Rogers Planning Commission. I'm Phil North. Chairman of the Roanoke Valley Allegheny Regional Commission and also a member of the Roanoke County Board of Supervisors, Hollins District. Jennifer DeBrule, I'm the Director of the Virginia Department of Rail and Public Transportation. Stephen Bridge, Commissioner of Highways, Virginia Department of Transportation. Shep Miller, Secretary of Transportation, Chairman of Commonwealth Transportation Board. Delegate Terry Austin, Chairman of the Committee. Uh, Delegate Tony Wilt, uh, currently uh, represents 26 House District. Uh, which is city of Harrisonburg and a portion of Rockingham County uh, with the new lines that have been drawn. And if I'm successful in the next election, uh, I would represent the 34th House District, which is city of Harrisonburg and a portion of Rockingham County. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Delegate Jason Ballard. I represent House District 12, which is Giles County, Pulaski County, Montgomery County, and the city of Radford. Uh, the redistricting will be under the new uh, House District 42, which is essentially trading Blacksburg for Christiansburg. Uh, honored to be here, Mr. Chairman. Uh, good afternoon, Bill Wiley, House District 29, uh, Winchester, Frederick County, northern part of Warren, um, running for re-election for House District 32, which will be moving away from Warren to more Frederick. Thanks for letting me be here. Bill Johnson, I live in Christiansburg. And I represent the board chair for New River Valley Regional Commission, as well as the chairman of the planning commission in Christiansburg. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair and uh, everyone in attendance. <clears throat> Thank you for being here on behalf of all the citizens of Lexington and as mayor. Welcome you to our uh, humble little city and invite you to come and mingle and maybe have happy hour after a stimulating meeting or a cup of coffee, whatever uh, your choice is. But my name is Frank Friedman and I serve on the Central Shandoah Planning District Commission and uh, also in the city of Lexington. Thank you. Hey, thank you. Thanks everyone for the introduction. Um, before we begin our regular business and it's not on the agenda, we, we have a little housekeeping measure that we need to correct. Back at our last meeting when I was nominated chairman and we took nominations from the floor for a vice chairman, uh, we nominated Delegate Wilt to be our vice chairman. And the typical process and procedure in the legislature is where we share joint committees between the House and the Senate. We will have either a House member chair or a Senate member chair and the other member being uh, from the from the other party, the vice chairman. So I think Delegate Wilt may have a motion that he'd like to put forward, and I would like someone to second that motion, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and while I'm certainly honored to be uh, considered the vice chair, I uh, would like to, to yield that, and I would uh, nominate Senator Deeds as vice chair of the committee. Second that. Okay. We have a motion and a second on the, on the floor by the committee. Everyone in favor of the motion, please signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed, nay. And I will say, Delegate Will was uh, all too eager to give that up, I'd like to say, <laughs> just for the record. Yeah, but, uh, yeah, so we're happy to have Senator Deed. Senator Deed has worked with us on this committee for a long time. And uh, although Cree's not here today, uh, I think he'll be pleased with the uh, adjustment. So thank you, Delegate Will. We appreciate you doing that. And, and my apologies that we didn't catch it sooner. Um, so... I hope everyone's had an opportunity to review the minutes from July 7th, 2022 meeting. Are there any corrections or the minutes or are the minutes adopted as drafted? Okay. Harold has motion. Second. Second. So we have a second. All in favor of accepting the minutes as drafted with no amendments signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed nay. Minutes are now properly before the committee. Um, 
stats. So now we'll move down to the I-81 Corridor Improvement Program update by Dave Covington, the director of the I-81 Corridor Improvements Program. Dave? <clears throat> Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Mr. Secretary, members of the committee. I'd like to provide you a brief update on the status of the I-81 uh, program. And I will begin by enhancing uh, what our benefits of this program are. So these are the core tenants that we come back to uh, every day in the delivery of the projects along I-81. The first, obviously, is enhancing safety. The second, reducing congestion. And the third, supporting economic development. This next slide, um, not only is it intended for uh, people, not necessarily in this room, but who might be watching at home to understand exactly where Interstate 81 is, but the more important <laughs> message on this slide are the localities along the corridor. Um, these are the people that we coordinate with on a daily basis. Um, we do not operate in a vacuum. There's extensive coordination that goes on with all the cities and counties along the corridor to make sure that everybody's needs are met in the design and delivery of the projects along the ID1 corridor. So our takeaway scorecard, this is, kind of gives you a, a quick snapshot of where we're at. Um, the top uh, are the operational projects. You can see there on the right, or excuse, yeah, on the right of your screen. Um, the first is incident, uh, improved incident clearance time. Uh, we have completed that uh, application. Uh, safety service patrol expansion. We'll take a little closer look at that uh, as we move through the, the uh, presentation today, but that is uh, complete. Uh, additional <laughs> traffic cameras along the interstate. We've installed uh, 51 additional cameras, uh, which report directly back to our traffic operations centers to, uh, to help us with improving incident clearance time. And additional message signs. So these are the big digital message signs that you see along uh, I-81 and other interstates. We've added 30 of those so that we can communicate directly with the traveling public in real time. So, Dave, if you would, please stop right there. Yes, Let me sir. ask, is there anyone on the committee who has any questions pertaining to any of those four category items that Dave just mentioned? So, Dave, explain to me instant uh, improvement clearance. I assume that's our TRIP program. Is that correct? It's primarily our trip program, yes. So um, our towing and recovery incentive program uh, is there to um, not only incentivize the towing industry for performance, but also ensuring that they have uh, the training and equipment necessary to deal with the incidents we have on Interstate 81. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Any other questions? Any other? I'm sorry, Mr. Mayor. Yeah. Um, could you comment on the impact of the digital messing message signs? I know that they've been um, relatively new. But how, are there any measures of success as well not that's having the intended effect? Yeah, I don't think we have any measured metrics on on the digital message signs themselves. But what our operational projects do is they, they do work as a system. So each uh, contributes to enhancing uh, the performance and operations and safety along the corridor. Um, one of the primary benefits of the of the message signs is that not all of these are located actually on Interstate 81. A lot of them are on the roads that lead to interchanges with Interstate 81. So if we have an incident on the interstate, the last thing we want is more traffic coming into that incident zone. So we use those digital message signs to warn people that there is an incident on the interstate so that they can take an alternate route. But we will, we will see some numbers here in, in the future or near future about uh, what does that performance along the interstate and those are all contributing factors. So Mr. Covington, let me ask along those lines of Mr. Merrill's question. I assume that would then lead to giving us the ability to control some signalization that would help move vehicles? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. That is the fifth uh, line there, the arterial and signal upgrades. Okay. Uh, and again, all of, all of this is a system. Um, understanding the construction that has occurred and will continue to occur for the next approximately decade uh, along Interstate 81, um, we did recognize that we need to improve uh, our arterial system or our detour route system. We do not have the most reliable alternative route along I-81, um, you know, Route 11, 460. Uh, they're great roads, but they run through urban areas. And the last thing we want to do is create a problem for a town, a city, a community uh, by rerouting traffic. 
So we do have a large program where we are primarily upgrading signal systems along those detour routes <clears throat> with smart signal technology so that our traffic operations center, if we have an incident, they can pretty close to push a button, change to a pre-programmed -pro signal timing to keep traffic flowing so we don't have secondary crashes along our detour routes. Thank you. And, and David, I don't mean to keep interjecting, but I think we've added signage on our secondary and primary roads directing people once they get off how to continue their path to the next intersection. And I think that's greatly yes. enhanced the ability to keep traffic moving also. So thank you. Proceed. Yes, thank you. So again, those arterial and signal upgrades, um, those are nearly complete. We have 43 VDOT signals that are complete, VDOT owned and operated signals. Uh, 39 VDOT owned and operated signals that are currently under construction and will be completed very soon. Um, we have 111 locality signals that are either under construction now or will be under construction in the near future um, and all be completed by 2025. So that is a large number of traffic signals that we were we are upgrading, not only to the benefit of the I-81 corridor, but also to the benefit of localities and the traveling public that use those routes on a daily basis. So now we move into the capital projects. These are your typical construction type projects. Uh, to date, we have completed 34 projects. And just a reminder that right now we have 64 capital improvement projects within the program. Um, so we are you know, a little bit beyond halfway complete with the number of projects. Uh, we currently have six active construction projects that are underway. One of those will complete next year. Two of them will complete in 2025. Uh, two will complete in 2026 and one in 2027. And you see those dates a little bit far out because now we are getting into the meat of the program. We are getting into the large scale heavy construction projects that we all anticipated. Uh, that leaves us with 24 remaining capital uh, improvement projects. Um, those are upcoming projects and all will be completed by 2033. And we'll take a look at um, what has been completed and what's in the program uh, as we move forward through the slide deck. Um, I've broken these down by types of projects. I think it helps people to understand the magnitude of the program and where we've emphasized improvements. Um, our largest projects are our widening projects. So I started with those. We have 10 total widening projects in the program. Uh, three, three of those projects are under construction now and will be complete, two of them in 2026, one in 2027. So that leaves seven future widening projects. Again, an addition of a lane in either one direction or both directions for multiple miles. Uh, those will be completed by 2033 or earlier. David, let me also interject yes, here. Uh, I, at my request, Commissioner Bridge and others have prepared a series of boards around the room that show uh, currently how many and where specifically the third lanes we currently have are and, ha and where the new three lane projects will be in the future on I-81 as we complete these projects and move forward. So I would ask everyone, please take time uh, when we conclude the business at the table to spend some time looking at these boards around the room. Uh, you know, we have and we have a great need for truck climbing lanes, but you can look at these and see where our future intentions are and where our focus is. So thank you, Dave. And thank yes, you. Sir, thank you. And, and just to expand on that, the small boards over here in the alcove, uh, those are broken down by construction district. So Stanton, Salem, and Bristol, there are three boards per district that show you different information. So all of our projects are on those boards. Thank you. Okay. Uh, moving on to the group of projects that we have the most number of, and that's acceleration and deceleration extension projects. We have 36 of these in total. 25 of these projects have been completed. We currently don't have any under construction, but we will have more in the very near future. That leaves 11 future projects all completed by 2023, excuse me, 2033. So what are the results of the acceleration and deceleration lane extension projects that we've put in the service? Our preliminary data, now this is qualifying that we have very limited amount of data. Usually we rely on three to five years to make sure that we're seeing consistent results year after year. But with the limited data that we do have, we're seeing a, a roughly 45% decrease in total crashes, which is significant. 
will that continue next year? We hope that it will. We actually hope it will improve even more, but um, we have a small data pool right now, so I do caution about uh, using that data. But I wanted to give everybody uh, kind of an initial look at, at how they're performing. You know, what is the result of that investment? Dave, let me yes, just sir. chime in with something. I think we, to be clear, the data is accurate. Yes. Okay? We just don't know if it's going to continue like that. We don't have enough trend analysis yet. So um, for the for the period that the data is on, the data is specific and accurate and complete. We just don't know is this what we expect next year, next year, next year, next year yet. So that's what we're trying to say there. We want to give you the we want to give you where we were, but not tell you it's necessarily um, a trend yet. So there you go. Yes, sir. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay, moving on to truck climbing lanes. These are also generally larger size projects, um, not quite on the, the scale of the widening corridor widening projects, but we do have five uh, truck climbing lane projects that are currently in the program. Three of those uh, projects are under construction. One will be complete next year. Uh, the other two will be complete in 2025. And we also have two future projects that will be completed by 2033. Now we move to auxiliary lane projects. Uh, we have four auxiliary lanes, and your first question is, what is an auxiliary lane? Uh, I know we're using VDOT terminology, but it is important. Auxiliary lanes are additional <coughs> lanes that connect interchanges. So if, for instance, you get on the interstate at one interchange and you want to get off the interstate at the next interchange, you don't have to merge into through traffic. So we reduce the number of conflict points by constructing an, an auxiliary lane. Um, but again, we have four auxiliary lane projects in the program. We have one that is complete. Um, we have three future projects by 2033, and actually one of those just got awarded uh, last week. So we had positive bids there, so that will be going to construction soon, and that's in the Stanton area uh, connecting the I-64 ramp to the exit at 262 uh, south of I-64. So excited about that project. Now moving on to shoulder widening projects and curve improvements. I've lumped these together. They're very similar, small number of shoulder widening. I figured let's put them all in one batch. Uh, nine total improvements. We have one shoulder improvement project that's in the program uh, that is uh, scheduled to begin construction in 2026. The curve improvements, these are flashing and static chevrons. So the arrow signs, you've probably seen them if you've driven I-81 uh, recently. Um, those, those are now all complete. Again, these these act as a system to try to drive down the number of crashes and to uh, enhance the reliability of Interstate 81. So we're going to see a statistic in a, a few moments that uh, this is a contributing factor. You know, these flashing Chevron signs. So now we get to uh, looking at some numbers on our operational projects. So these these are our operational projects, the five that we went over first in that takeaway scorecard. And we're going to put some numbers on them. You've already seen that we've added 30 additional digital message signs. That's in the top left of your screen. We've added 51 additional traffic cameras. Safety service patrol, we've expanded that. There's a number of different ways to look at this, but what we have now is full operational coverage on Interstate 81. Um, what does that include? That includes an additional 45 miles of coverage. Um, this seems like a simple thing, but due to shifts and, and vehicles, it's a it's a pretty big expansion of resources. Um, mm -hmm. And if you were if you drove a long distance along I-81 to get here today, I certainly hope you saw a, a safety service patrol vehicle. I saw three this morning on the way here. So um, we have uh, much enhanced coverage, and um, that is another part of the system that's helping us to keep Virginia moving. I uh, mentioned earlier the arterial and signal improvement projects. Um, there we have an additional 196 signal improvements. So there's, well, 193 signal improvements. We had three minor geometric improvements uh, located here in Rockbridge County that contributed uh, to that statistic. Uh, and then clearance time. So this is primarily our trip program, but it's also our safety service patrol operators and our traffic operations centers contributing to this. What we have seen to date is about a 24% decrease in incident clearance time, and that is significant. Um, we've seen our numbers really drive as a result of the TRIP program, but, but also 
you know, early recognition of crashes through the cameras and enhanced uh, safety service patrol. So again, you know, five improvement types, you, you can see them on the screen, um, 43 VDOT signals complete, 39 under construction, 111 uh, locality signals that we're working on, and there's three geometric improvements here in Rockbridge County that are complete. David, can you expand on uh, what your safety, safety service patrols do? What, what, what services do they offer? Yeah, absolutely. They offer just about any service, but I mean, you know, some of the things that, that they do offer, I mean, certainly protecting an incident site. Um, anytime we have a vehicle on the shoulder, that is a risk. Um, I've seen it so many times where just a vehicle sitting on a shoulder gets hit by another vehicle for whatever reason. So they protect that site with their error boards, their message boards, the flashing lights. Um, they can do tire changes. They can provide a gallon of fuel. Uh, they can give a vehicle a jump start. Um, provide access for a phone if they, you know, or call towing services. Um, so there's, there's, they can provide directions. I mean, it, they're really there to help with whatever is needed from that driver. And in a lot of cases, it's a medical emergency. And so they're, they're calling 911. So it, it does oftentimes equate to life, life saving services. Thank you, Dave. You're welcome. Thank you. David, can you speak a little bit about the traffic cameras, the, intent or use of those? Yeah, well, the traffic cameras, if you ever visit one of our traffic operations centers, and we'd, we'd love to have you, um, it's pretty impressive. It's it's a room full of screens, and they're constantly being monitored by the floor staff at the traffic operations center. So a lot of times they can witness or see that there's an incident on the interstate as they're scanning different segments. And we don't have yet complete coverage because I-81 has geometric you know, it has curves and hills that cause us to have to install more. But it has really enhanced our traffic operations center's ability to recognize an incident early. And then they can also monitor the site during recovery. Um, you know, I myself, I'm always wondering, when are they going to get out of the road? When are they going to open the lane back up? The traffic operations center knows before anybody. So, yes, sir. This question, Doug. anyone at the table, please speak up. Don't you don't need to speak to the chairman. So go ahead, Delegate Wilt. Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, <laughs> David, uh, so a couple of things I noticed at home, back up, back up the valley here. Um, our local radio sound. I'm old enough. I listen to AM radio, and um, <laughs> I, 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 quite often hear, uh, you know, they're they're citing traffic. Uh, situations. I mean, they'll even go as far as over on 64 or, or up and down 81. And uh, and, and then also uh, our local newspaper. I, I read a newspaper too. And they have a they have a little write up there about once a I, I think it's at least once a week upcoming things that are happening through VDOT on road project. That's phenomenal. And, and, and but my question is is do you all coordinate that or is that those folks at home do I, I mean the, like the camera thing the radio station are they going on your site and picking that up and reporting it or I'll be quiet and yeah, let you, yeah, yeah. you know most of that is coming from VA five one one so that's our integrated system that anybody can go to and get information about lane closures or work that's upcoming um, we also publish you know weekly look aheads on you know, what's, what's going to come out that gets sent out in distribution lists oftentimes to news agencies. So they know that there's a paving project that's going to occur from this exit to this exit. That's, that's where they're getting that information. So we do try to be very transparent and share uh, that information as best we can. But VA 511 is certainly kind of a one-stop shop for understanding what's going on on the interstate system and other roads. David, of these operational centers, do you have one per each of the three transportation districts, or are there more? I know there's one in Salem. I visited that one, but are there others? Yeah, yeah, they're, they're pretty much broken down by district now. We've decentralized operations to district level. Commissioner, you want to speak on Mr. that? Mr. Chairman, along the 81 corridor, we have Salem, and the Stanton district has one. So we have full coverage of the 325 miles out of those three centers. We have another one located in Richmond, another one located in Northern Virginia, and then the Hampton Roads region has one. So we have five traffic operation centers that that monitor uh, all of all of the Commonwealth roads. And they are very impressive. I mean, I, I've been in them, and uh, it's amazing the view that we have with the cameras today 
and how quick quickly we can react. So, sir, very well. thank you, Dave. Yeah, that's our thank communication you, hub for incidents, certainly. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right, I think this is the uh, slide that really shows progression of projects, and I'll explain this a little bit. On the top where you see those diagrams and numbers below them, that is the project status today. That is where we're at, and I'll briefly go through that. We have two projects remaining in the planning stage. We have four projects that are what are in what we call the preliminary engineering and environmental evaluation, and I highlight the word evaluation there. Um, 18 projects in design right now. You'll see an asterisk there because we have three projects that are on our construction advertisement schedule um, that are uh, will be awarded in October and November. So they've, they're at the finish line. We're just waiting on bids to come in. Um, we have we don't currently have any projects that are specifically in the right of way and utility coordination phase, which is a good thing because we move those projects into construction phase. We currently have six projects in the construction phase. And as you saw earlier, uh, 34 projects that are completed. Below that was the status that we showed at our last meeting in July of 2022. And you see that those numbers are shifting toward the right. And that's what we want. We want projects working through the project development process. And that's what this is. This is our process laid out. Um, but you can see compared to last year, we've moved projects through the process. Um, like I said, we've got three projects in design that, you know, in the matter of the next couple of months will be in the construction phase. So I think this just helps highlight on an annual basis, you know, we've completed uh, 11 additional projects, moved a lot of projects into the design phase. <laughs> so we are seeing that natural progression. And the projects that we do have in the design phase right now are generally some of the biggest projects that are in the program. So if I may take a look. How do you typically procure these projects? Are they design build only or are they a mix? And how do you, how do you delineate between the two? Yeah, so for construction? Correct. Okay, so we have two processes. We have design bid build. We call that a traditional process. That's the way it's worked for many, many, many years. And then we have design build. Uh, design build is where we contract with a team of engineers and contractors to deliver a project. So we are able to get to that construction phase a little more quickly. Um, there are, uh, it's it's not a random assignment of what is a design bid build project versus a design build project. What we're looking for in a design build project is opportunity and innovation. How can a designer and a contractor team accelerate a project, value engineer a project, deliver it more efficiently? If there is opportunity for that in a project, and usually those are the high risk projects, the ones that there's a lot of question marks about, um, then we, we may elect to go design build uh, and put that out for a, a consultant and contractor team. Um, if a project is very standard in nature, you know, we're, we're widening for three miles, it's nice and level, <laughs> we're widening to the median, there's no, um, there's not a lot of variables involved or a lot of risk. Um, then that makes a very good traditional design bid build type of project. Okay, so where I'm going with this is if there's a, let's say the contractor you awarded it from a design build perspective, if there's value from the design, excuse me, from a design build contractor team to save money, is there a shared savings or some type of, um, is there some type of mechanism to get them to do that in order to try to find ways to save money for the Commonwealth so we can use this money somewhere else? Yeah, and, and we go through a value engineering process. Okay. Um, it, we define the scope of the project. And if a design builder is working within that scope, there's not opportunity for costs to go up or down. Uh, they're, they're basically delivering what we ask them to deliver. If a contractor comes in with a value engineering proposal and says, we can do this part of the project and save $10 million, of course, we <laughs> scrutinize that. We want to make sure that what we're seeing is legitimate and acceptable and follows our standard policies and procedures. But there is cost sharing at that point once we enter that value engineering stage. And it's usually a 50-50 cost okay. share. Fair enough. Thank you very much, Mr. Yes, Chairman. Sir. Yeah. Mr. Chairman. Yes, sir. I think it's also important as we look at this, and you'll see more of it when Ms. Farmer does her financial update as well. You know, the, the projects that we've done early in this progression have been the easy ones to do and 
the sort of low-hanging fruit, the operational projects. And so while we see, and I just think it, I want to be clear, and it will become even more clear, and we'll double down on it. But we so we've done 34 projects, right? It says completed. And there are only 64 projects, right? You might say, well, we should see half the benefit. And the reality is we spent like 12% of the money. And you're not going to see half the benefit because a ton of the benefit is at the end in, in 27 and 28 and 29 and 30 and 31. And so just understand as we're going through this that a lot of the stuff that we've done has not cost a lot of the money. And a lot of the stuff that was really going to make additional big impacts are in these 18s and these 6s and these 4s. Um, that are on the left side of the screen. So they're coming and they're going to be there. And you're going to see a lot more orange cones and it's going to get more difficult in some places. Um, but that's what we do. <laughs> so that's coming. Thanks. Yes, sir. Thank you. Okay. So I'm not going to go through every one of these projects, but somebody who lives in Bristol District is going to want to know what's on this slide. And it will be on our website after this meeting. So uh, you can go through and scrutinize every uh, interchange that you live at or, or work at. Um, but you can see how many projects have been completed in Bristol District. They tended to have the smaller, low-hanging fruit type projects that we deliver very quickly. Bristol District has done a fantastic job of moving projects through the project development process into construction, getting them constructed and moving on. So um, again, great work in Bristol District. So what's under construction in Bristol District right now? We've got exit 39 northbound entrance ramp uh, to mile marker 40.6 truck climbing lane. You're going to notice a theme here, truck climbing lanes in Bristol District. Three of them under construction right now. Um, mile marker 32.4 to 33.5. These seem like small projects, short, but they have a big impact because when that truck doesn't have to obscure other traffic, it just makes life much less miserable for people who are commuting on the interstate. So we look forward to these being completed soon. You can see here the first one at the top uh, will be complete in June of next year, and the other two will be complete in June of 2025. Moving on to Salem District. Um, there are fewer projects completed in Salem District, and the reason is, is that Salem District generally has much larger projects. They have fewer projects, but they are larger. The, the area between Christiansburg and Troutville is going to be a heavy construction zone here in the very near future. So what's been completed? Exit 89 northbound acceleration lane, great. Troutville rest area. Um, I think this was an innovative project. Um, it's actually two projects that we bundled together, the entrance and exit uh, to and from the Troutville rest area. Um, the reason that this was innovative is that during the design of this project, the folks in Salem District realized an opportunity, and that was to expand truck parking without significant additional cost. And that's exactly what they did. And if you drive down through uh, toward Troutville right now, you'll see that it's heavily used. So a good return on investment on that to keep those trucks off the shoulder because they keep getting hit when they're on the shoulder. So we expanded it by 12 additional parking spaces. Um, very, very happy about that. And then we had three uh, curve improvements uh, in Salem District, and those were uh, just south of Draper and just south of Natural Bridge, actually extending up, I think, in the Stan uh, Stanton District. So what's under construction now? Um, if you've driven through Salem or, uh, recently, you know. Um, the exit 137, the exit 141 widening project, both in the northbound and southbound directions, that is a design build project. It's two projects bundled together. That project is nearly 50% complete. It's going very well. The completion date on that project is January 2026. But this, that project is indicative of what we're going to see all along the corridor in the near future. When we, when we start uh, moving these large widening projects into the construction phase. Okay, moving on to Stanton District, you can see we've got a rather large number of acceleration and deceleration lane projects that are complete. Um, we had one curve improvement project in Stanton District and that was at Mount Jackson. And what is under construction now? Um, exit 221 to exit 225. So this is the I-64, I-81 interchange in Augusta County, uh, north up to 262. 
a, a large scale widening project. Um, we just awarded this uh, project earlier this year. They are currently completing the design. Uh, we look later this month, we look forward to them starting shoulder strengthening so they can move traffic to put in their barrier wall. They will begin their production construction in the spring of next year. Okay, these are the upcoming projects along the corridor um, in each district, Bristol on top. So you can see kind of what's coming in the near future here, and you'll see some, some large projects. Exit 72 northbound deceleration lane, that uh, will begin construction next year. In fact, all of the uh, Bristol district projects that I've got here on the slide will begin construction next year. Again, they've done a fantastic job of moving projects through uh, quickly. Uh, mile marker 8.1 to 9.7, one of the larger projects in Bristol District. Um, that actually is one of the projects that's on our, um, our bid schedule right now, and the letting date for that is October 25th of this year. Exit 72 deceleration lane in Withful, uh, that letting date is November 15th, as is the exit 72 to exit 73 auxiliary lane extension, uh, again, letting date November 15th. So projects coming here in the very near future. Um, we also have a you know design build project that's that's on ad there. Uh, so we're we're very excited that Withful area. We've got five projects at that one interchange. It's going to be it's going to be a busy area. <laughs> Moving on to Salem District, and here's where you really start seeing big projects. Exit 143 to exit 150. So that is from the 581 interchange north to Troutville. That that's the 220 Route 220 interchange is one of the largest projects uh, in the entire program, you know, roughly $450 million project uh, that we are advancing as a design build project, and we hope to begin construction on that project next year. So that will be an impactful project, uh, not only in the short term, but certainly in the long term. Exit 128 to exit 137. Yes, sir. What's the timeline, David? Is, has there been given a timeline for construction of that project? The duration? Yes, sir. I uh, believe it's a five-year construction duration. So uh, okay. began construction in 2024, complete construction in 2029. Yeah, I know that is quite a, uh, a congested and lengthy area. That's why I was curious as the time on five years. Okay. Yeah, yeah. And, and that is a challenging project. Very much so. Yeah, and so that's there's a lot of opportunity there for innovation, and that's why we've chosen to go the route of design build. That's an area of the truck way station also. Yes, sir. Yes, yes, sir. So thank you, David. Thank you. Exit 128 to 137 uh, widening. This is only in the northbound direction for this project. This goes from Ironto to Salem. So effectively at the base of Christiansburg Mountain, you come down Christiansburg Mountain and trying to kind of calm down a little bit from that journey. And um, this project will widen to three lanes. It's a long project. You can see there it's uh, roughly nine miles in length and it will connect to what is under construction right now. So you will have that continuous third lane. Uh, that is anticipated to go to construction in 2027. And um, mile marker 116, this is at Christiansburg to exit 128, also in the northbound direction. So it's that same stretch of road, but widening to three lanes coming down Christiansburg Mountain from Christiansburg uh, to Aranta. Uh, we anticipate that project to go to construction in 2028. Moving on to Stanton District. Mr. Uh, Chairman. Mr. Chairman. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. On the uh, exchange at Iron Toe, is there anything going to be done south of that? So if I'm not mistaken, that's the really treacherous coming down the mountain where there are huge close calls with tractor trailers yes, in that section. Yeah, that's the uh, mile marker 116 to exit 128 project. So you it will go from Christiansburg and we will have a continuous third lane all the way to 581 at the completion of that project. You're welcome. Mr. Chairman. Yeah, and to just add on to yours, I see that it's northbound only, and you you addressed the northbound, but I think the gentleman was talking also about southbound, uh, which is just as dangerous as the northbound area. And I'm seeing on all these other projects, um, addressing climbing lanes, extra lanes, northbound, southbound, northbound, southbound. But yet in the Salem area, we only seem to be addressing the northbound area. Yes, sir. And why is that? Well, the the southbound equivalent to the northbound project from Ironto up to Salem, 
is one of the five projects that last year we recommended for inclusion into the program. It right. is identified as a need, but it's not yet in the program. And it is on one of these boards <sighs> behind me. So that's going to be discussed. Uh, I believe, Laura, you're going to go over that in the financial presentation. So, Dave, taking us back to the beginning of this, and I wasn't here, Mr. Chairman, but there was a, a look at about 112 projects originally, right, that needed addressing or that we thought needed addressing. And when we came back with the number that would be associated with that, they said, that's too many, that's too big, so scale it back. So we kept the 112 around, we didn't forget about them. We scaled the plan back to 64 to match the funding during the term, which was 2033, 2034. And so these are the ones that bring the most impact is the concept of the 112, and so we're gonna deliver those first. It's important to understand in this program, although it doesn't help us today, um, this money is into eternity unless it's stopped, the funding stream. It's not a truncated, there's no sunset on it. So there's a, there's a funding stream right now that General Assembly has put in place that will continue for 81 until it's stopped. Um, and so there's just more projects to come and we'll see some of that. But I guess the, the, the point was the, the committee and the, and, the, and the engineers decided at the time that these were the projects that delivered the most result, the best results. And so they became the 64, the 112 that we proceeded with. But the rest of them are still out there and we're feeding them in as we can, given the money and the contractor base and regulation and so forth and, and the, the regular timeline. So it's just a matter of cost benefit at the end of the day is what is how they were selected. Is that correct? That is correct. But to, to continue on, Mr. <clears throat> Chairman, the mile marker 116 to 128 in the northbound direction, that is two lanes today. The southbound direction from 128 southbound is a three lane section today. So it's already, already, it's already three lanes. So right. this is why we're gravitating toward the northbound direction, at least in that. At least in that place. <laughs> in, in that in that one location. The Aranto project is the only one that has been identified as one of the next five projects to be included into the, the suite of the next set of projects for inclusion into the program. I understand. I would just say that uh, <clears throat> I understand the concerns associated with the down the mountain and I and I certainly want to you know, I want a three lane all of Interstate 81 and certainly from 119 to 150, the, argue, the targeted area, but there is a nine mile gap on the south side in Salem that we're not doing as the secretary spoke to. And the reason we're not doing it is we, we didn't have the dollars in the plan at that time to fund that. Because of that, if we do not do that concurrently with the northbound side, there is a substantial savings that could be incurred if we were to do the southbound along with the northbound side. Right. And that is quite alarming to me that we're, we're not going to do that concurrently while we're working on the northbound side, go ahead and do the southbound side. So, Mr. Mr. Chairman, I would double down on that. Um, we've had a lot of discussion over the last week is to, you know, how do we move this around not only to be effective, but to be efficient. And what the chairman's speaking to is the efficiency piece of this. And so it's in our crosshairs. You know, we didn't set the plan per se, the committees and, and everybody set this plan, but at the end of the day, I'm, I'm pushing to see is there a way to, to get the savings while delaying a little bit of the effectiveness, but the, but the savings would be greater than the, the delay of the effectiveness, if you will. Yes. And so we're looking hard at that. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you. So looking at uh, Stanton District, the exit 221 to exit 220 southbound, I've got that on that list. This is the project that was, uh, bids came in last week, looked favorable. So uh, we're in good shape there. Exit 299 to 296 in the Strasburg area. Construction is expected, that's the southbound widening. Construction is expected to begin on that in 2024. Both those projects are traditional design bid build projects. Uh, Weir's Cave northbound and southbound truck climbing lanes. This is two separate projects that we will certainly deliver under one contract for efficiency. Um, we do anticipate that construction to begin in 2024. Uh, exit 242 to 248 northbound and southbound. So this is widening through Harrisonburg. 
this is a challenging project. We have worked diligently through the design process, extensive coordination with the county, the city, um, you know, water, sewer, you name it, it's there. Um, that that project is uh, coming along well, and we do anticipate uh, construction to begin in 2025. That will also be a design bid build project. Uh, and exit 313 to exit 317 northbound and southbound widening through the Winchester area uh, on par with the complexity of the Harrisonburg widening project. Uh, we anticipate that project to begin construction in 2028. If I may, uh, Mark, I might steal your thunder. Um, <laughs> with exit 313 to 317, um, of course, we live there and understand that area very well. Is there any way that you would take into consideration or studying the exit 321 to extending it up to that uh, to that exit considering um, the amount of traffic that is incurred up through almost the to the West Virginia line is has there been any consideration to that matter and second it's so it seems like this is still in the six-year plan we're okay there right in terms of funding this is the 300 million dollar project correct yeah, that, that project is not yet in the six-year plan. It's not in the six-year plan. But it, we're working on trying to get that into the six-year okay, plan. Okay, so, now. and then quite, I guess a, quite, an, a question back to the exit 321. Has there been any consideration for extending that to that line? We have evaluated extending to further to the north. Um, we have not looked at going all the way to exit 321, but certainly beyond the railroad crossings. Right. Um, right now, uh, that, that scope of work is, you know, it is what it is. So uh, I think it would take certainly more action than I'm available, uh, or more authority than I'm available to give for that. But we certainly <laughs> understand that need. Mr. Chairman, can we give them the authority? I'm well, Dave, you, you, have our, just, you have the privilege, Dave. You just act on it. Okay. Yes, sir. We we have done a rather extensive study on on that situation there at exit 317 and understand it well. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Well, Chairman. And just to echo Delegate Wiley, mm -hmm. um, this shows expected to start in 2028, but it's not in the six year plan now. So is that truly a realistic number unless something else changes? Number one and number yeah. two, um, the echo. I mean, that intersection 317 is the worst intersection in in the Stanton district. It is kerfuffle of poorly lined streets, very short acceleration, deceleration lanes. And there are three projects that are about to start in the next two years that could be much more efficient if there are a way to accelerate some of the widening. So I'm not sure how we surface this because we have roughly 50 to $55 million of construction soon to start with Red button, rain, red button lane realignment, northbound deceleration line realignment, double diamond interchange, bridge fixtures, et cetera. And then we're going to come right back behind it and start working on widening. It just seems like it would be advantageous to find a way to coordinate the multiple projects at the same time. There's a cost savings. Is this at the Route one, Route 50 interchange? No, sir. This, this is, is at Route 11. Route 11. Route the north side. North side. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. The north side. Okay. So is this the project that I understand may not have the funding to get it into the six year plan? Yeah, th there's two projects right now, one in Salem District, one in Stanton District. The Salem District project is the Christiansburg Mountain project from mile marker 116 to 128. And in Stanton District is the Winchester widening. So we we are looking at every opportunity and, and possibility of funding those projects and advancing those projects. And, you know, is 2028 a realistic date? Um, we do think it is. I mean, that project was identified as a strong design bill candidate, um, so we could accelerate the project um, through that that delivery method. <clears throat> David, let me be clear because we get tripped up on this sometimes. So we've got a plan for 81, right? And it is the 81 plan. It's got nothing to do, per se, with the six-year plan. It's the 81 plan. Here's the plan. Now, we have to marry that on the CTB side with the money for the 81 plan. And our money is constrained in the six-year plan, right? So we look at it six years at a time, not 10, not 15, not 20. The 81 plan is longer than six years. So we're, we're, the six-year plan is about the funding. And what's happened is as things go up or they go down, we push things out or we pull them back. We do that all around the, the Commonwealth. That's what we do every day. Hopefully we're pulling them in, not pushing them out. In this case, 
we've got one that got tripped over the line and it's about half short, so it's going to move a year or so, maybe a year and a half. Budget changes and our revenue changes with next fiscal year. If that's good, we'll pull it in. If it's bad, we'll push them out. And it's not just 81, it's everything we do. And so that's sort of how it works. We're just matching the operational plan to the funding plan and marrying them up. So when we say it dropped out of the plan or it's not in the plan, that doesn't mean it's not intended to be done. That doesn't mean we've forgotten about it. That just might mean it's not in this six years, it might be in year seven and eight and nine of the six year plan and they don't exist in the plan, in the, in, the, in the constrained plan. So I just wanna be clear as we talk about that. We're not suggesting we're not gonna do something. It's a matter of when it happens, right? The 81 plan has not changed. That's what some folks are looking at, asking about today. Should we do this instead or that instead or add this to it? That would be a change of the 81 plan and it would affect the six year funding as well. Mr. Chairman, a question. Yes, so the 150 million, Mr. Secretary, that got removed from the budget could come back in the next year or two in the future. Is that correct? 150 million that was uh, requested in the budget for I-81. Um, yeah, but you're conflating different things. The six year plan, generally speaking, is coming out of the normal funding that we have. It's not general uh, fund funding per se. It's all tied to mm -hmm. the to the fundings of, of transportation. Mm -hmm. And so things that they do additionally over and above that or over and above, and we don't know what they're gonna be till they do them. We can project everything else based on our projection of revenue, but what the General Assembly and the governor may or may not do, we don't know. And so we'll react to that if and when that occurs. Sir, Mr. Mr. Chairman, just uh, another comment, kind of going along with everything I'm hearing. I'm, and I, and I'm, I'm glad that the, the plan is somewhat fluid because things change and just because I guess I'm referencing the the project there in the stand district uh, 242 to 248 even beyond the ends of those uh, you know there's been de recent developments there at home I mean we we got news of the Bucky's uh, facility uh, that's a t t in my mind could very possibly be a game changer and and they're putting another travel plaza on the north up to 251. And so, yeah, I'm just I'm, I'm glad that we're we're able to, you know, keep looking at those things. We're we're not so yeah. We need to move ahead. No one wants to hear that they're and I would no way promote that taking somebody's project away from them. But but yeah, we we we've got to be a, a little bit flexible as we go through this journey, if you will. Mr. Chair, I also want to recognize that we are also at Aranta once again putting in another truck. Uh, facility that's going to house a lot of truck vehicles right there. So uh, that's going to be a lot of movement, both northbound and southbound. There is at, at the Aranto <laughs> exit? Yes. Yes, I believe it's a, a pilot uh, center with multiple places for trucks to uh, park overnight. Voting issue. Yeah, one, one of the things that we struggle with, um, and the chairman has talked about <clears throat> before, um, and because I've heard him a, a lot of times talk about it, is the coordination between the local planning folks and us. Because what happens, or what can happen, is local planning folks do what local planning folks do, and then like look at us and go, well, what are you going to do about it? <laughs> well, we didn't create it. Like Maybe we need to be thoughtful together and understand what's going to get created by doing this, and then you need to understand what you're doing to yourself and to others and maybe there's a different way to do that. And I'm not saying that doesn't happen, but sometimes it hasn't, as the chairman says, and boom, here you go. Well, I, I you know. So it's a good problem to have, sir. It's a good problem to have. We just need to make sure we try to manage it as best we can. Yeah, and, to, and to that point, we went, Mr. Chairman, we flew down, or we, we met with some Bucky's folks down in South Carolina to look at their facility and to see how it operated in and out. I mean, this is an incredible thing if you've never seen a Bucky's. 140 pumps and a gas station, 140, and no trucks. And people just come to hang out there. It's like a place of gathering. But in any case, they wanted to show us how they ingressed and egressed and what was important to them so that as we're doing the work that we're doing, we can understand how to adapt to them 
properly. And it's a heck of a lot better on the front end than boom, here they come. And we got a, and we got no money. We got no plan. We've had no conversation and we're reacting to it. So. As the secretary said, oftentimes in the Valley, we'll approve land use or zoning changes that have a, a negative impact. To ha- uh, if we have trucks entering the interstate on the north southbound side on uphill grade, for instance, and it really slows down and backs up traffic and creates a world of problems for us. I think we have to be very strategic in how we identify where those sites are suitable. Certainly they're necessary, but we can sometimes, if we collaborate and work together better up and down the corridor, we'll have less consequences to deal with. Certainly we want to and appreciate local economic growth. It's very beneficial as we all know, but it does have huge consequences. So, um, but, uh, you know, inflation is just eating away at our projects here. We all know that. And, and we have to be cognizant of that. And we have to be concerned when we do not have funding in a plan that we're taking projects out of the plan, as, as the Secretary said, because we have to have the funds to cover the project if it's in a six-year plan. We can't put it in a six-year plan without funds to cover the project. So we're all going to pay attention to that, and we're going to be aware of that. Um, but... You know, it's very concerning to me because we don't have enough dollars, as we know right now, to do what's necessary. If you will visit these boards, you'll see that these boards, I think we have about 58, 59 lane miles of three lane. And when we finish, we'll have 88, 89, somewhere there about. We have 640 lane miles on interstate. And we all know the importance of uh, just the comfort of being on a third lane, a three lane portion of Interstate 81 to versus a two lane portion of Interstate 81. So that's, you know, that's what has me very, very concerned as to where the future revenues are going to come from. And this, the legislation that we passed in 2019 provided for the very first time a sustainable funding stream for Interstate 81. It had never had a dedicated sustainable funding stream, which is very, very sad in today's world. I mean, so, uh, you know, we're, we're making progress. I don't want to throw any gloom and doom on anything. We are making progress and we should all be proud of the progress ourselves and BDOT have made and the staff and Dave's work. But we got a lot of work ahead of us, folks, as we all know. So any other questions, Dave's this time? Dave, go ahead, sir. Thank you. Okay, I just wanted to include a slide with some pictures of our current construction project in the Salem area from exit 137 to 141. Uh, this project is moving along very well. We've got a great partnership with the design build team, uh, and it's it's an example of what's to come along the corridor. I mean, you see, if you're driving through it, you understand that, you know, barrier wall goes in, everything kind of gets a little bit smaller, a little bit narrower, makes people a little bit more nervous in the short term. But in the long term, you know, the impacts are, are tremendous uh, for operations and safety. Um, One of the things that we were able to do with this project is ensure that we had some shoulder area and not just let it become two 11 foot lanes and barrier wall. You know, we need to provide that access for emergency responders and that's what's out there today. And so for the past almost two years, that's what we've been living through out there. And, you know, we're starting to see a little bit of light at the end of the tunnel with this project. And I think it's a, a great example of a, a, a contractor and a designer truly partnering with VDOT to deliver a project as efficiently as they can. So, Now I'd like to just highlight um, some of the videos and podcasts and newsletters. We have focused intensely on external communications, on communicating to the public this, not only the status of, of the program, but what's to come as far as traffic impacts. You know, we want to make sure that we are over communicating to the point where people want us to almost stop talking about it so that they can plan their lives. <laughs> you know, if they want to take an alternate route and you live in this, you know, you live in travel and you work in Roanoke, you might want to consider that or, you know, just deal with the fact that you're going to have slowed down traffic. I mean, we, we do our best to keep it moving, but um, to date we've published 22 videos and these videos are about specific projects. Um, so if, if I would encourage everybody to, if you have curiosity about a project in your neighborhood, so to speak, um, there's probably a video about it. Uh, If not, you can let us know and we'll make a video about it. Uh, We've also done 22 podcasts. Usually those 
podcast and those videos are about the same subject, one short format, one long format. In fact, we just did one this morning and we're filming another video tomorrow. Uh, and we've published 11 newsletters to date. So if you'd like to stay informed through newsletters, you can go to improve81.org and sign up to be on the distribution list for our newsletters, or you can just download them right there from the website. And again, this is just me pushing our improve81.org website. It's our one-stop shop for information about 81, and you know we're pretty proud of it and keeping it up to date, and a lot of effort has gone into it, so I encourage everybody to visit. Any further questions? Mayor? Yes, just, sir. just a comment. Um, I know you're beginning, Chairman Austin, you mentioned about the work that the VDOT team does, but I would just like to, to add my sincere appreciation and acknowledgement. Um, these incident response teams are phenomenal. I mean, those men and women put their lives on the line every time they go out and help these disabled motors. And many times you see there's not a whole lot of room between them changing a tire and the, and the big trucks. So um, thanks for that effort and just encouragement to continue to ask these responders to be very safe because I do see them four or five feet from the edge of the road as opposed to moving as far as they can. Thank you, Mr. Merrill. Any other comments? It, I don't know if it's Brian. part of the uh, programming per se. It's not outlined, but the rumble strips that are along the interstate, um, those are a terrific addition. Cost-wise, are they... Is that difficult or expensive? Yeah, they're, they're very effective from a cost perspective. Um, those are all installed through our maintenance program, uh, except for when we have new construction, we require the installation of rumble strips um, with the final product. Well, congratulations and thank you. The Chevrons, <clears throat> the parts of 81 that I travel, it, uh, especially in the evening or uh, in the dark, really illuminates it and makes it abundantly safer. And I know that was a small change, but a very, very positive impact. Um, but a question being, um, and maybe I'm jumping the gun, with the improvements, are there any uh, rail? Uh, it seems like we have some budget cut out for rail. Is that to come in the? Jumping the gun. Very good. I'll, I'll wait patiently. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, if, I, if I'm responsible like for to, rail now, it's going to be a, a, a big undertaking. <laughs> we like to stay ahead here in the election. Yes, sir. <laughs> good work, Frank. Good work. Okay. Thank you very much for your any time. Any other questions, comments? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you, David. Well Thank done. You. Appreciate you always. Okay. Next on our agenda is the I-81 multimodal improvements plan with Zach Trogden. I'm sorry, Trogden. I apologize. And he is the chief of public transportation for the Virginia Breeze Inner City Bus through DRPT. And I think Jennifer De Brule is here also. Jennifer, where are you? You're at the end of the right. table. I thank you. We're in a gun, right. Jennifer. Forgotten. Jennifer is the director of DRPT, by the way, and she does phenomenal work for us with Amtrak and other services. So thank you. Zach. I can give you a brief update on rail once Zach is finished. Thank you. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I didn't know we were going to get a Bucky's reference here, but pleasantly. So we have one going on in New Kent, so we'll see which one comes first. Uh, you all can come to visit, but uh, we have tumblers and stuff in our house from the Florence location. So uh, let's talk of the, talk of the Commonwealth, I guess. Um, thank you for a, a few minutes today to um, discuss some of our improvements out on I-81, um, those being our Virginia Breeze service. Uh, it's it's only a few years old, but we think it's making a big impact um, out here in uh, in the valley in the I-81 corridor. Um, for some of you who, who, who may be new to this, uh, again, I'll say this is relatively, relatively new, launched in 2017. Um, and the purpose of the uh, inner, inner city bus program is to connect non-urban areas to some of those, uh, you know, urban areas that have that reach out to to other larger, um, you know, more populated areas for, uh, um, you know, for whatever whatever reasons people want to travel. Um, so we do operate at three three hundred sixty five days a year. Um, one of the great things is we and you'll you'll keep seeing on other sli other uh, subsequent slides that we do utilize federal funds for this. It's a combination of funding. Um, some of it, you know, actually the smallest part of it being I any ID one fund. So. Um, now, we don't operate with our staff. We do contract out for the service. Uh, right now, we have a contract with Dillon's Bus Service, and um, so that's been very effective as well and been a great way for us to carry out the, um, the mission. Um, so here's just a, a graphic of our, of our routes. You see what we're talking about here is, I don't know if you all can see it very well, um, the green, which is the uh, um, Highlands Rhythm. You know, shout out to the Carter family, I guess. Down in, down in that area. So, um, and then of course the uh, the Valley Flyer, which originates in Blacksburg, there, um, you know, 
great service to uh, university community, getting them up to the Northeast Corridor, Sela Corridor. So um, it's been very effective. So uh, really to show you sort of the sort of the great story. Um, 2017 is when you can see the uh, um, the Valley Flyer originated. And so that's been growing every year. Went through COVID, has come back though. So, so a great story to tell there. And also you can see that, um, you know, when COVID was still a thing, uh, hopefully was still a thing. Um, we, we began the, uh, the Highlands rhythm. And so that, that only had a short time in 21, but so what you see in 22 has continued to, to, to grow very well. So then you see some projections there. We, we certainly project that these, um, you know, our ridership is going to continue, um, to go up. So, so now just to show you how this is funded, as you said, um, uh, operations, we get 243,000. We got that for a number of years from some of the ID one funding that's, that's, uh, that's carved out here. Um, and then, uh, we also just have some capital, uh, you know, a relatively small amount of capital to do some shelter improvements in at a couple of our locations. So that's what we use some capital for. But certainly the bulk of it is used for the O and M expenses again through a contractor that we have. Um, so, you know, it's a good model because, you know, passes off some of the risk, but we've, we've been very happy with, um, with how we've been able to operate it. So this just gives you a little bit of a comparison here. So, um, when I say that we utilize, uh, uh, we're able to leverage some federal funds, you see here, we both have both the CARES Act funds, which were at hundred percent, no match. And then the 5311F, um, just so you all know that when you, you see all these kinds of numbers I got into transit at one time. These 5311s are the section of the Code of Federal Regulations, just so you all can go look it up if you if you feel like you're so led. So, um, but we're able to, to leverage that federal funding. And then a uh, fare box recovery of, all, of over 50% is fantastic. So you can see this is supported by the public. Um, it allows us to really be effective and provide a, a great service. So um, this is a great uh, example, I hope you see, of just, just uh, you know, levels of government coming together as well as the public being in on something. So it's a um, I've been very, very pleased with this uh, this um, slide as well. So, really, that's just kind of a high level overview. If y'all have any any questions, happy to address them. Um, as as uh, Director De Brule said, she's happy to talk about rail as well, which is something she's um, come much more, much more accustomed to. So, anyone thank you, any, thank you, Mr. Anyone Chairman. have any questions of Zach? No. Okay. Thank you, Zach. We appreciate you. your time. Uh, Jennifer, would you like to update us on rail, please? Say very briefly on the rail. Jennifer, um, do you mind going up front to do that? I don't have any slides. I'm going to be you really don't brief. Need slides. <laughs> uh, there is funding out of the ID1 multimodal program for passenger rail, and that is to support the extension of passenger rail from Roanoke into the New River Valley. Uh, we're currently working on uh, engineering plans once we get to 30% plans, uh, which we anticipate over the next six to eight weeks. Uh, we're going to be in a better position to talk about timing and uh, implementation of that extension of service uh, to the New River Valley. But we're really excited about it. Team's working very hard over at the Virginia Passenger Rail Authority to make that happen. So next commission meeting, we'll give you a full update on where that project is and um, okay. that extension. Thank you. And Jennifer, you are going to be presenting at the uh, Governor's Transportation Summit later in October. Is that correct? At the Transportation Committee, yes. Yes, that's correct. Update on Passenger Rail. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions from Jennifer in regard to passenger rail? Okay. If not, we'll move down the agenda to finance update by Laura Farmer, Chief Financial Officer of VDOT. Laura, please. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, uh, members of the advisory committee. Thank you for having me this afternoon to talk about the financial picture for the I-81 program and give you an update as to where we are to date and the picture going forward. So just as a reminder, um, in 2019, as been mentioned earlier, uh, chapters 837 and 846 established a dedicated revenue stream for the I-81 corridor improvement program, a dedicated fund, and it provided dedicated transportation revenues to support the interstate highways and specifically I-81. Um, the very next year, 2020, before the world shut down, uh, the General Assembly did a lot of great work related to the transportation omnibus legislation, a significant piece of legislation that did a lot of structural changes across the Commonwealth transportation funding um, picture, and also changed a little bit about how Interstate 81 funding and funding for all interstates works. Um, 
For 81 specifically, it authorized $1 billion in debt that could be secured. Um, we are using the fuel tax revenues on the corridor to support that debt. It also changed the localities that contribute to the I-81 program. And so before it was aligned with planning districts along the corridor, and now the locality must be, uh, the ID1 passes through it, or the cities are wholly encompassed by a county through which 81 passes. And so those are the unique localities that contribute their fuel tax revenues to the I-81 program. Uh, the legislation also provided a dedicated funding through the Interstate Operations and Enhancement Program, which I'll talk a little bit more about subsequently. Specifically for I-81, there are two dedicated revenue streams to support the work on the corridor. Um, the first being the regional fuels tax along the corridor, and the second is a share of statewide revenues that are made available through an allocation from the Interstate Operations and Enhancement Program, or IOEP. Uh, the regional fuels tax uh, began in July 2019 as an additional 2.1% tax on gas and diesel sold by the distributor. With the restructure and that 2020 omnibus legislation, um, the tax rate became a cents per gallon rate and it was subject to a CPIU adjustment each year. And so beginning July 1st of this year, the tax rate assessed statewide, but also dedicated to I-81 is 8.8 .8 cents per gallon for gas and 8.9 cents per gallon for diesel. These funds we leverage for both the debt on the corridor as well as pay go to support the project cost as time moves forward. So Laura, if I may, those okay. accumulated totals are only pertaining to the cities, counties, and towns that I-81 passed through. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Okay, thank you. And then an allocation from the Interstate Operations and Enhancement Program comes through um, a uh, code required formula related to the truck traffic uh, vehicle miles traveled on the interstates in Virginia. And so the corridor receives an allocation equal to the ratio of that VMT um, to on what's on 81 compared to all other um, interstates across um, the Commonwealth. And congratulations, you're the winner. Um, the I-81 receives 43.7% of the allocation available for interstates due to the truck traffic on the corridor. And so both of those pieces contribute to the fund itself. And with those funds, we plan to deliver the improvement plan as Dave just mentioned earlier today. All right, Laura, you caught me thinking there. Re repeat that percentage again. I'm sorry, on the... Yes, sir. It's 43.7%. Um, based on 2021 uh, traffic data that we have. Okay, and in the future, Laura, if you can show us or define for us that percentage of increase annually when you present to the I-81 committee or- Yes, sir. At every meeting, it would be nice to know of that. Of course. Just so we know what that percentage is growing. Thank yes, you. Yes, sir. It has been small decimal points okay. each year, but yes, of course okay. we will. Thank you. Mm -hmm. In terms of the planned use of the regional fuels tax, this graphic just describes how we structured um, the, the debt moving forward on the corridor. Uh, the fuels tax goes to both senior lien debt service and any junior liens that we take out along the corridor. And it's important to note that it can only be used, we can only get debt service funding from the fuel tax revenue along the corridor that protects it from the debt capacity of the Commonwealth considerations and um, those sorts of things that allow us to uh, balance the debt need on the corridor against the revenues available and the timing of the projects. Um, in terms of through fiscal year 23, which just ended on June 30th, I wanted to provide a picture of just where we are um, in terms of uh, revenues received and how much we've spent. And so the table on the left-hand side just provides the sources through 2023. Um, this represents four years of the program. So just shy of $300 million in fuel tax revenue, um, $266 million from the Interstate Operations and Enhancement Program provided through both state and federal sources. We also had other sources prior to fiscal year 2021 when the program began, there were some dedicated um, truck derived fees that were dedicated specifically for 81. Um, those became part of the Commonwealth Transportation Fund with the omnibus legislation. 
and then the fund has earned interest um, in recent years for a total of $595 million um, from state sources. We've also secured debt financing from both bonds and two TIFIA loans totaling $203 million. So we're just shy of $800 million through 2023. The right side demonstrates the expenditures. Um, the two top rows are just in terms of cash on hand and bond funded activity. We're just over $200 million in project activity to date um, with a small amount for debt service and financing. And then the, the remaining balances available for future improvements is highlighted at the bottom of the table. So Laura, correct me if I'm wrong, is that about $150 million, million a year? Is that roughly? Yes, sir. I have a subsequent table. It's about 200 million average, but yes. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So to the chairman's question, um, this table highlights the revenue performance and our projections. So the first column gives that four year picture that I highlighted before, as well as projections. Um, the regional fuel tax revenue estimate we get from the Department of Taxation. And then the interstate operations and enhancement program allocation represents 20% of what's available for construction distribution dedicated to interstates. And then from that, we apply the I-81 share to it to provide a dedicated allocation to 81 over time. And the remainder are just one year uh, previous balances provided for a total state funding. And then we've highlighted the planned debt for construction just at the bottom of that row. So overall through 2029, which is our six year planning period, we have $2.8 billion available for the program. But to your question, the annual average of the projection is about $211 million each year. Okay, as I recall, Laura, back in 2019, when we put the plan in place, we we're anticipating about 150 million reoccurring revenues per year. So it's up to 200 million. Yes, sir. I think okay. um, fuel tax revenue is definitely doing better than anticipated back then. And um, overall revenue streams for the Commonwealth Transportation Fund are doing better than expected as well. Thank you, Laura. Laura, what's your basis for the increases on the regional fuels tax each year? Um, CPI. CPI is really driving that. In the department. UCPI, I think it's UCPI. Okay. Thank you. Laura, can you go back, Mr. Chairman, can you go back up to the slide, back one slide? So um, under activity, right, on the right-hand side, we see expenditures and we see PAYGO, bond financing, financing costs, et cetera, $209.5 million. Tell us again what that represents, that all the expenditures to date? Yes, sir, it does. Okay, so how big is the program now? 3.1 billion. 3.1 billion dollars. We've spent 209 million. Okay. That's what I want you to remember. All right. There's in terms of dollars. Now we've gotten some, you've saw some improvement in one little metric, but in terms of dollars, we've spent 200 million of almost $4 billion. And that's where we are. And so some of our angst is rooted in that, in that there's only so much money we've spent so far, and a lot of money's getting ready to get spent. Now, we've done a lot of good, but just understand that's where we are in the program. Mr. Secretary, I have a question for you. Yes, sir. Um, on the original plan, we set aside 200 million for projects other than uh, construction projects. Are you saying those dollars, those 200 million still there? No, no. what I'm saying is that of the total money that's going to come to us, $4 billion or so to execute this program as it stands today. Okay. That we've only spent, we've only spent $209 million okay. of the 4 billion we're going to get. And we've spent them on the projects that you've seen completed. We've spent them on the, the programming and the planning and the P&E and all that. But all this stuff that's getting ready to happen, all these ones that we saw coming up, these construction projects, they're going to take that $200 million and they're going to shoot it to the stratosphere. But that's where a lot of the bang for the buck is going to come, or at least a lot of the buck is going to come. So just understand, we got a $4, a $4 billion house that we're building, and we've spent $200 million so far. So don't expect to see the game room and the kitchen looking real good yet. 
right? It's just not there. Um, we got good architecture plans. We got good engineering. We've done our sites. We got our land. We got this. We've done some stuff. We've done some grading. We put in some utilities, and now we're getting ready to rock. And that's where we are sort of in the cycle. But I think also, Mr. Secretary, I think we've used some of those dollars to prepare for the connection from Roanoke to Christiansburg with rail. I think did not some of those dollars come from the I-81 other than other than surface transportation for rail? There, there are rail improvements that are programmed, but they're still in development. So they're also, in, to the Secretary's point, in the pipeline. So Noakesville to Calverton, third track, right. or Noak Yard improvements. And so those are, BPRA is working on those, but those funds, to to the Secretary's point, have we had to, spent. Jennifer, did we not have to spend quite a bit of money to make acquisition of the Virginia line from uh, Norfolk and Southern? We, did we pay for that out of the 81, $200 million? We did not pay for that out of I-81. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Laura. If I may, how long does it take to pay off a project, the capital itself? So if you have an operate, you're going to these numbers here on a bond, but how long does it take? What's the what's the bond term? You follow me on that? Yes, sir. Of course. So um, of the 203, about half of that was some municipal debt we sold in 2021. They're considered 25 year bonds. Okay, 25. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Working. Okay, um, just to advance, um, what we do is use those funds to pay for the program. And so um, we've entered into um, some municipal debt in 2021. We uh, took out two TIFI loans in December of last year. We have yet to draw on those. Our cash position, as well as the status of the projects, allows us to wait until project completion to draw on those loans. That obviously helps with um, the debt payoff and 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 that moving forward. And so this just gives you a picture of the debt service going forward. Um, in 2029, we're at about $24 million worth of anticipated debt service. Uh, in the mid 2030s, we're probably approaching $60 million after we've exercised all the debt on the program that is currently authorized. Um, then we take the remaining fuel tax revenue, the allocation available for interstates um, from the program itself, um, we also have some financing costs to enter into those debt arrangements, and we have a total available for programming to projects and then the planned debt, again, totaling $2.8 billion through the planning window through 2029. So to a, to a point earlier that the secretary made, the estimated cost of all the improvements along the corridor today is $3.1 billion um, with the projects implemented through 2033 based on what we know about the current revenue streams, as well as the project's anticipated spend schedule. So our current six-year program runs through 2029. The Code of Virginia requires that the Commonwealth Transportation Board fully fund projects within the six-year window. And so we are unable to fully fund projects, though they're anticipated to be completely delivered in 2033, based on what we know today. Um, we do have some undistributed balances um, to the to the um, related to the two projects discussed earlier. And so those will be available and put on those projects as we can fully fund them to their estimate. Um, I'd like to point out that no single project exceeds 15 and a half percent of the program due to the updated revenue estimates and each project is independent of each other. Mr. Chairman, I have a question. Yes, sir. Smaller. Could you go back to the previous slide that showed the uh, ramp up of the fuel revenue? It looks like the remaining, okay, the fuel. In your calculations, did you take into account any shift to electric vehicles? No, sir. So VDOT relies on the Department of Taxation to provide the revenue estimate for us. So we take it exactly as it is. Um, the last time I looked at some of their narrative on that, they expect um, small changes in the fleet out there, but not anything that's a tremendous incremental shift. They obviously do not plan out further than six years as well. And so we're carefully watching that moving forward. Thank you. Sure. Go ahead, Laura. Sure. So I just wanted to highlight the planned debt mechanism for the remainder of the debt authorization on the corridor. 
Um, as I mentioned earlier, we entered into two loan agreements um, late part of 2022 um, with the Build America Bureau, which is part of the U.S. Department of Transportation. We're able to secure Transportation Infrastructure Finance and Innovation Act loans, otherwise known as TIFIA loans. Um, the proposed structure allows us to reap tremendous benefit related to savings on debt service. A rule alone, depending on the um, population base along the corridor as 150,000 or less um, around the area, allows us to finance up to 49% of the project cost at one half of the 30 year treasury rates. And so usually that is a rate that is much better for the department and the Commonwealth Transportation Board than what I could secure in the muni market. And so um, it's advantageous to um, enter into these loan arrangements and the corridor is ripe for rural eligibility if we can keep the project costs below $100 million, which is another program requirement. Um, and then we also have the ability to just do a regular TIFIA loan, which allows us to finance up to 33% of the project cost with no project size limitation. Um, it has a repayment term of up to 35 years after substantial completion. So to your question earlier, we'll be definitely taking a look at that. And we're also counting on that fuel tax revenue to continue. Um, but it also has a flexible payment structure and draw period. So from a cash position, if um, VDOT and the Commonwealth Transportation Board can afford to not draw on the loan until much later, um, we have the flexibility to do that. But we've decided that this program itself provides the most um, nimble flexibility for the department related to debt financing on the corridor and its projects. And Laurie, now rate about two and a half right now, Is that about half the treasury rate? I think so. About two I'm, and a half is what we get, get so pretty good money. That's that the TIFIA's two and a half? Yes, sir. Yeah, I knew it was quite favorable, so good, great. Um, as I mentioned earlier, the fuel tax on the on the corridor is what supports all the debt issue, so it does not impact the debt capacity of the Commonwealth. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we did a, a, a muni deal in 2021, um, but for the foreseeable future on the program right now, we're currently just based on rates, um, planning on TIFIA loans for the future, um, right now totaling $962 million um, for future financings. So as discussed earlier, two of the originally prioritized projects remain to be added to future six-year program updates, but pending sufficient allocations to do so. Um, one of them, the northbound lane from mile marker 116 to 128, discussed earlier. Its current estimate, based on the delivery that um, Mr. Covington provided earlier, is $360 million. Um, additionally, the widening three lanes northbound and southbound from mile marker 313 to 317 has a current estimate of $333 million, again, based on the delivery window that he presented to you before. Today, I have $289 million undistributed to projects available for projects, but we could not fully fund to either of these estimates. And so that, those are the ones that will be added in future updates to the program. Or can I stop you right there for one second, please? Yes, sir. Uh, pertaining to the UPC three lane northbound, southbound, 113, I mean, 313 to 317, an estimate of three, estimate of 333 million. Is that, is, is that number, if those projects are done concurrently? Mr. Commissioner or Secretary, can one of you two answer that question, please? Mr. Chairman, that the, the particular 313 317 would be both northbound and southbound simultaneously that's the way it's programmed in the in the in the program right now so that they would be done simultaneously. we have no intention of breaking those apart this, this is not the pickup that uh, we this were looking is not for. the nine million no, nine not mile lane okay, no, okay. Not, this isn't the pickup all right the potential pickup thank you i, I stand corrected yes, okay so so what i think this is important because what um What's being presented here that Laura is telling us is as the money shifted around, we had $289 million and this was 333. Okay. So we were $44 million short because of the way the funding changed. And that pushed it out. That would push it out the window, right? But it's not like 300 million. It's not like 333 million out the window. It's 40 some million. So it's, it's going to get pulled back in. Um, or it's going to happen. Excuse me. It's going to happen. The next, it's not like gone forever. It just got pushed out a little bit. And and that's frustrating to all of us, to the chairman's point earlier, I think. Inflation is crushing us. And the longer we wait, the worse it's been or it's getting. 
Now, thankfully, the rates come down, but still it's eating us every day. And so we're pushing hard to do things faster. And we'll talk about some of that in a minute. But at the end of the day, this is not what we prefer, but it's not the end of the day either. I mean, this is going to flip to the next year. And it'll get picked back up and we'll keep moving. Um, and, it, and if the revenue estimates go up, as they have been doing, um, you know, we've missed our estimates a few times on the low side, which has been great. Um, then these things will, you know, we're just formula funded and you sort of, you sort of start at the top with state revenues and it all falls down and a bunch of it goes here. So that's what will happen. So, Mr. Secretary, you referenced 40 million shortage there. How much short are we on the 116 to the 128? Okay. Oh, just add them together and okay. subtract 289. Gotcha. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Could, could you just comment? I mean, the 116 to 128 is 30 million a mile, and the 313 to 317 is 40 is 41 million a mile, and the right of way is there. There are no creeks in that 313 to 317. Can you just comment why is that much more expensive? You went by my pay grade, sir. Um, I, I, I will tell you before I ask the commissioner or the chief engineer. Um, these numbers are staggering numbers to us, right? And you're going to hear in a little bit a 30 million or 35 million dollar amount number. The truth is, we're seeing them every day. When we went back in an earlier slide, I was going to wait um, to, to speak to it later, but we talked about a 450 million dollar price tag, and it was 14 miles. Do the math: 32 million a mile. That's what we see in the market in this. And it depends on where you are. Like we get down into the rock further down, it gets much worse. You know, it's not green fields or sometimes have rocks underneath them. Um, and so, but that's what we're seeing in the industry. We're not unique. And we'll hear more about that a little bit by reference going forward. I, I can't answer the question, Mr. Merrill, but maybe Dave can. I, I can add a little bit to that. It, there are um, certainly the Winchester area is very urbanized as opposed to Christiansburg Mountain. So there, you know, acquisition of right of way costs more. There are more bridges. Um, bridges are a, a major factor in that 317 to, or excuse me, 313 to 317 project through Winchester is looking at those bridges. Right now, you know, we're not allowed to work on the project, so we can't go out and investigate the condition of those bridges, the vertical clearance. So they're you know, there's a, a factor of safety in there also for whether we have to do full replacement of bridges or we can do widening and rehabilitation. No, I understand, but the, the bridge on 50 at 313 is separately funded. Yes. That's yeah. not included in this number here. The overpass that, bridge? The, the 50, the Route 50 bridge at exit 313 right. is yes. separately funded yes. out of this. So there, there's only one bridge between 313 and 317, and that's a non-access bridge. It's just an overhang. Yeah, I mean, the simple fact that we're in an urban area, it complicates things. There's, there's many more utilities. You know, Christiansburg Mountain, there, there's effectively not much out there. There's a lot of risk of rock excavation and things like that. But what we've seen in the projects that pass through those urban areas, 40 million per mile is, is, has been a better estimate than 30 million per mile in the rural areas. Okay, we do our own. We do our own um, estimating of projects that we sort of benchmark against, and we have competition in these projects. Is that correct? That, that's absolutely correct. Not only do we do our own estimates, we usually have independent estimates that are done as well to validate our estimates. And as we go through the, looking at these projects, uh, we we look at our own estimates. We look at the competition amongst the bidders and try to make sure that we think we've got good competition or if we don't, we accept it and, under and understand why. Um, and so there's a fair amount of focus on this. We don't just sort of, and Mr. Merrill knows that, but he's frustrated by it too because it's too darn much money. Um, but we're, 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 we'll continue to focus on that. And, and um, that's, those, are the, those are the levers we use. Our own internal, some consultants help um, estimating and, and then competition in the market. Yeah, absolutely. And I'll add one more thing that um, as we work through the project development process, that cost estimate changes up or down. We always hope it changes to the downside, 
but sometimes we find something like a, a bridge that we thought was in good condition and is deficient or a major water line that needs to be relocated because we didn't know it was there at the time. So th that that cost estimate is a very early estimate that we'll refine as we move forward. Ms. Kai, maybe, maybe you can share that with Mr. Merrill and help him see what you're seeing. Sir. Mr. Chairman, I also have one more comment. And uh, sure. Mr. Covington, I may be addressing it to you too. Um, looking at the northbound, southbound area again in the Salem District, northbound is on its way. Uh, I believe the comment was made earlier that when you look at these projects together, sometimes it's much, there's more cost savings to do north and southbound savings. So the question is, was the southbound area considered as a cost savings to do it at the same time northbound was being done? Yeah, there certainly is efficiency in delivery of northbound and southbound simultaneously. Um, we've, uh, we've identified approximately $70 million that could potentially be saved if northbound and southbound are constructed under one contract. Thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, that, that's why we're focused on it. Thank you, sir. Quick question, uh, or point, sir, Mr. Chair. On that, uh, on, uh, on that same mile of interstate you're talking about, I believe that was the one we requested smart scale consideration on, but it didn't score very well. And I'm wondering if there's $70 million of benefit by doing the projects uh, in both directions, should that be reconsidered in, in another round of smart scale? Because that to me is money that you can leverage to improve the score. Now, I'm, I'm just asking a rhetorical question, but the benefits of scale certainly need to be taken into consideration, I would think. And it surely has the support of the Roanoke Valley Allegheny Regional Commission, as well as uh, New River Valley, I'm sure, because we, 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 we had quite a program to point these things out and when we went to the CTB and spoke. So I just asked that question, if it's $70 million of benefit, are we, should we give serious consideration going forward? And you know, another thing too, and I, I like this pretty discussion on the per mile. I took the 143 to 150 uh, public hearing, went over there. Someone told me, oh, it's not gonna be a lot of people there. Well, that, that was anything, but that was not true. It was plenty of people there and it was uh, greatly attended. And I came back and I spoke to my board and to the commission in two separate meetings. And I pointed out $34 million a mile because that's what resonates with people. You give someone a project cost. Oh, okay. That sounds like a lot of money, but you talking per mile that gets people's attention and it lets them know how serious this is and how, how much money it takes to get these projects done. And, and to the secretary's point, you can't get them done overnight. You just got to get them done along the way in that six year plan. Thank you. Mr. North, um, if I may, Mr. Sure, please. Uh, Mr. North, we're going through a um, some tweaking of the smart scale right now. The way that it works in, in terms of the scoring, if it came in with a project score, excuse me, if it came in with a project cost that did not um, reflect the cost that, that was done simultaneously um, and it reflected a cost perhaps up to $70 million more, then it would not have scored as well. If it came in with that in it, it would have scored just the way it would score now. Um, and so I don't, I can't answer the question of how it was submitted. I don't know that answer. Um, but it certainly would have, if the lower the cost, everything else being equal, the higher the score. Does it mean it gets funded? No, it doesn't mean it gets funded, but its score relatively would be higher. And so to your point, it would be better if we, if we looked at it that way. But, but we've identified it, listen, these aren't simple. You can't just pick one up and move it. It doesn't work like that. But we've been talking about this for, for a little bit of time now in, in our shop to say, you know, if it was $3 million, we probably wouldn't be sitting here because we'd spend $3 million trying to figure it out. I mean, seriously, just in time and waste and, 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 and other stuff. But it's, it, you know, a number and 70 might be a high number. But 50 is good enough for me, All right? So we're going to chase it and see if we can make sense of, of of it. But there's, you know, there's other considerations that we got to we got to include. And by other considerations, it's time, regulation, contractor base. What else is going to get moved? What cost does that push that into? There's, you know, it's in a sequence now that everybody's sort of blessed. Said this is a sequence, 
And whenever you disrupt that, you got to make sure you understand all the implications. So that's what we're trying to do. Or say, Laura. So with all of this in mind, I'd like to give you a, just an extended financial outlook for the I-81 program. Um, as the secretary mentioned earlier, these revenue streams as they're currently laid out are in perpetuity um, related to the fuel tax revenue dedicated to the program, as well as a share of the interstate program. Uh, this slide provides the preliminary funding by year and by source. And I'd like to do a little bit of explanation about the graph <laughs> at the bottom. Uh, it's really busy. But uh, the greens and the blues highlight our current sources and how they'll be expended over time. The black line that tra transverses the entire graph represents the revenue stream available for the I-81 program and its expectations. What I'd highlight for you is beginning in 25, just so, and uh, really taking off in fiscal year 26 through 28, is we're spending almost double in terms of the expected expenditures of the program to deliver all those projects that David talked about. Um, and what we've done is grown a fund balance as well as exercising our debt capacity in those years to support those projects activity. Um, the salmon colored and the striped yellow color represent some additional funds that could be used to support projects over time beyond the 64 that we've talked about today. So with that in mind, through 2040, based on current projections, we estimate nearly $1.9 billion of additional project costs could be supported through that time period. When we consider the current program being complete and fully funded by 2033, and most of that funding available after 2033. And Mr. Chairman, Farmer, if I can jump in. So if you start at the left and you look at 2020, 2021, 2022, 2023, that's where we are. OK, then look at everything to the right. Everything to the right that is not um, in orange. Is what's sort of in the current plan, right? So look how much more there is to the right. That's green and blue. That's not that's to the right of 2022, 2023, a lot. Then look at the orange and say, this is what we think we can do in on top of what is already in the 81 plan, right? So remember, we started with 112. We went back to 64 projects. So the orange represents opportunity beyond the 64 projects that are in the plan today. And that's what we also are trying to look at and say, here. and here's what's in the future. Um, you see some of that creeps in a little earlier, but most of it is out there in the out years. So that's the, that's really what you should take away, is we've only gotten to 2023, and that's all we've done. All the rest of the green and the blue is what's coming. It's funded. And then all the rest that's in the orange is what is funded by projection, but is not in a not in a plan to do. That's that's the opportunity going forward as it stands today. Fair enough. Thank you. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, Ms. Farmer, that's a great slide. Thank you. So the black line is the projected fuel tax revenue for the A1 corridor and the interstate operations fund, and you're projecting that to grow in the latter part of the 20s and into the 30s, above the 210 million now. Thank you. So if I read that correctly, in 2040, we should have roughly $300 million annual appropriation in revenues looking forward for Interstate 81. And at $35 million a mile, if everyone would visit these boards around here, you'd catch my concern very quickly. Yes, sir. There's where our, I mean, not to be critical of anything we've done, certainly to the Secretary's point, it looks very promising that's where that, to, until we get to the conclusion of the plan. And that's where I think this committee should begin to focus. We have a path until 2031, 32, Beyond that is where I think we, we'll be right back just like we were in 2019 or 2020, essentially, because the revenue stream is non sustainable to meet the demand. Correct, Mr. Chairman. It ain't on anyone's parade, but you yeah, know. I, I, agree, I agree completely with you, Mr. Chairman. I mean, how many lane miles do we have in the Commonwealth? One direction, what is it? 326, 40 total. 320 about. total on either side? Well, well 320, well, 320 on either rate, side. So if we take that number and divide it by the 35 million current dollar per mile, 
and to the secretary's point, what we're doing right now is great. I just think that in terms of the volume of adding another lane, I think my grandchildren's grandchildren might see that completed. I don't know. I'm just thinking. Overly optimistic. Okay. Thank you. You know, and, and let me be clear. Um, you know, 95 south of Richmond, 64 west of Richmond, two lanes. A lot of two lanes left, right? Gap will get done, but that's 30 miles of two lanes. You're, you know, it's not the only place we got, we have this issue. It's clear. Um, but I think, I think that I'm, I'm, I'm a believer that when we finish 2033, it's going to be a lot better than it is today. But it's to your point, it, <laughs> it's hard to keep up. I mean, I, I hate to say it, but go to 95 in Fredericksburg. It's just hard to keep up. We just got it to Fredericksburg, the express lines, right? And you know what's going to happen. In six years, we're going to be at Atlee Elmont talking about express lanes because that's where it's going to end up. And, you know, we're just chasing it, which is why um, what Deborah and uh, Deb, uh, what Jennifer, excuse me, and her team do on the other side of this, on the other pieces of this are helpful and important. Very challenging. Very challenging. Or, or, or please. So as we came to you last year, it's just a reminder about the potential for additional projects in the plan. So as the secretary mentioned earlier, there was a much longer list of projects considered uh, back in 2018, identifying 106 improvements for consideration. And we prioritized 64 based on appetite for funding, as well as uh, revenue sources that were being identified at the time. Um, additional projects from that list could be amended to the quarter plan, so the department is positioned to add those projects to the program as revenue is available to support them. Um, as I mentioned before, those current revenue projections support completion of any additional projects estimated at $1.9 by 2040. would add its preliminary um, and may require a small amount of additional debt capacity. Um, however, those five, we, we were able to narrow that to five additional projects beyond the original 64. And they represent the most complex, highest risk segments of the remaining capital projects in the plan. And Laura, those, that 1.9 is in today's dollars, is it not? Yes, sir, it is. Yes, so sir. not inflated. So it's 23, 14, 17 from now. So, um, these are the five additional projects. The first one is the missing southbound section that was mentioned earlier, um, and then the remaining projects listed here total a low range of um, around $670 million to $888 million in 2022 dollars. So they're uninflated to a potential delivery year. However, we did some analysis with our financial advisor just to take these very preliminary estimates and kind of layer them into the 1.9 billion. Um, we think based on inflation that the department is using today, um, those projects could be delivered by 2038 with an estimated inflated cost of about a billion and a half using the high range of the estimates provided just to give an order of magnitude to what's of, of what we were able to perform. And if you look at those and just do the quick math, you'll see those per miles jump around depending on where they are, Mr. Merrill. You know, it's a fair amount, right? 30 to 40, somewhere in there, 28 to 40. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> I'm all over it. Yeah. Let me just say this. I don't want to delay the meeting, but when I was on the board 10 years ago, the transportation board, I was astounded when we were doing a little bit of, of, of the bike and, and ped trail down near Williamsburg. And we were, we were doing an additional five miles of trail. And I, I envisioned a bike trail like the trails I, you know, it was, a, it was a, a path. You could walk on it, you could bike on it, right? Maybe add a little gravel on it or something. You know, it was reasonable. And it was a million dollars a mile. I want a million dollars a mile, right? Well, when you get into what the bike path has to have and the ADA and this and the safety and that, that's what it costs. That was 12, 12 years ago for a bike path was a million dollars a mile on that project. And I was just blown away. 
Thank you. Corporate meeting the horse center. Yeah. <laughs> Might be riding horses. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Continue, please. I'm sorry. So just to summarize the information I presented today, um, updates to our project estimates reflect the market conditions that VDOT is, ex is experiencing and is expected to experience for the next several years, as well as refined project scoping and the debt assumptions. Um, though we're getting really good rates with TIFIA, as you can imagine, treasuries have gone up slightly since we talked to you a year ago. And so that um, increases the debt service on the program. Um, so that all those factors combined just ex um, push the delivery of the complete program out by one year to 2033 from what we talked to you about uh, last July. Um, however, it's important to remember that the revenue and the allocations that support the program are very strong and we anticipate that to continue. Um, and as I noted before, the capacity for those additional projects um, from the available programs current funding will become available in the early 2030s. And I'll take any additional questions that you might have. Chairman. Yes. Laura, if I may, I want, I want to make sure I understand the answer that you gave to the chairman's question earlier about the um, gas tax revenue. Did you say that only those localities that border the interstate pay that tax? The tax is assessed throughout the state. Just for I-81, it is those that in which I-81 passes through or the locality is encompassed by county in which I-81 passes through. I think Roanoke is that one exception by that definition. And so, yes. Okay. The, and so the remainder of the localities in this region of the state those funds are dedicated to smart scale to the construction district grant program. All right, thank you. I just received some conflicting information, so I wanted to understand exactly what locality along I-81 is paying into that and what locality may not be. Yes, sir. We can provide that list to you as well. Okay. And that, and that, Mr. Bauer, uh, that was a change from what the way it had been. It was everybody, every, every PDC or every member of the PDC along and there were some that might have been a county or, or two over, if you will, and and they didn't they didn't think they should be included, and so the general assembly changed it. Well, not all of us in the general assembly changed. It. Yes, sir. <laughs> I understand. <laughs> I understand. Thank you all okay. very much, Laura. Thank you kindly. Okay, next on our agenda is the uh, public-private partnership P3 market sounding findings and analysis. David Spector with the company of KPMG Infrastructure Advisory and Sasha Page with IMG Rebel Group will give this presentation. Let me give a little uh, uh, prefer, uh, preliminary intent of how we got to where we are with this market sounding study. A group of us, along with the secretary and the Commissioner and the governor met in Richmond in February, January, February, and decided that we would look at some possibilities for some options on how to proceed with some of Interstate 81 that may create some more opportunities. So what you're going to see today is a presentation on the conclusion of that study based upon these two gentlemen's consulting firms work. So if you would, please. Mr. Chairman, yeah, if I can just jump in and add, yes, add to that. So my earlier comment about running, has, running faster and jumping higher, this is about doing more faster, right? How do we do more faster? Or how do we do it faster? How do we do more? Or how do we do more faster? Um, all the above. So um, the, uh, the chairman, as he indicated, and the governor um, asked us to go look at what are the, what are the, what are the opportunities here? Um, and so what we did is we hired um, not one firm, but two firms, and it was on purpose. Um, so we hired KPMG, as, as the uh, chairman indicated, and Mr. David Spector is from that firm. We also hired IMG Rebel Group, um, and Mr. Sasha Page will, is here from that firm. And the reason we hired both is because we thought they both had some interesting and unique talents. KP, KPMG is sort of the, you know, the tried and true big blue of the world, if you will, in that arena. Um, uh, so, sorry, maybe they should be called the KPMG of the world instead of your big blue of the world. But um, and Rebel is a, is a niche firm that's well known in this business um, and is quite capable. So we put the two together to get sort of different eyes from different places, um, which I think has really been successful. So, um, Dave and, and Sasha, maybe you could just give a little bit of intro of each of you two and then and then go. 
Uh, thank you very much, um, Mr. Chairman and, and committee. Appreciate having the opportunity to be here. I'm Sasha Page, principal from uh, Rubble Group based in Washington, D.C. and I have been a financial advisor advising state DOTs and other transportation agencies for over uh, two decades and um, appreciate the chance to talk to you and, and, and present uh, our findings. Thank you, Mr. Chair, committee members, Mr. Secretary, Commissioner, David Spector with KPMG, Big Blue, if you will. Um, I lead our roads, highways, and bridges practice surface transportation for KPMG across the United States. Uh, I was formerly a state DOT guy. I worked for the Colorado Department of Transportation running their public-private partnership office as well as their 200 miles of express lanes. and recently rolled off uh, as the president of the P3 division for the American Road and Transportation Builders Association. So very happy to be here today with you. David, before you begin, let's, I'd like to ask the uh, commission, if you would please make some notes and let's kind of hold our questions to the end and the essence of time. We're bumping up at three o'clock now. And and so let's, if you would, let's, let's allow these gentlemen to make their presentation and we'll ask questions. So thank Mr. you. Mr. Chair, we'll be, uh, we'll be as efficient as possible, but Please feel free. If you'd like us to get detailed, more detailed, we'd be happy to do that as well. Thank you, Dan. Yeah. Anyone needs drink or water, please feel free to get up and go have, help yourself at any time. And that's audience also, please. So. Okay, we'll get started if that's okay. <laughs> uh, so as, as mentioned, um, the VDOT uh, engaged in a process to ask the private market, the public-private partnership market, the P3 market, their thoughts on whether they could accelerate this program, as you've heard, using a P3 process. And that's a process, a, a, an engagement process that we were part of beginning last year. And again, for those of you to just explain a P3, uh, as we're defining it, and I think it's commonly known, is design, build, finance, operate, and maintain done by a private party or consortium of firms under a long-term contract, 30 to 50 or longer, uh, very similar to the kinds of uh, transactions and, 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 and agreements that VDOT has currently on I-66, 495, uh, other projects, the uh, Elizabeth River crossings. Um, so the Commonwealth reached out to large construction firms and uh, actors in this in this um, in this industry and asked them for their thoughts and we were uh, um, involved in, in evaluating that that process called the market sounding process began in, in 2023 um, and we had the benefit of looking at their um, their their input uh, ha having a chance to talk with them and having a dialogue with them and ultimately evaluating them um, we asked them to look at both a 102-mile um, segment uh, under, as well as a 323 or 25-mile segment as well. We also look, asked them to look at a managed lane approach, um, which is a variable lane, uh, or a all-tolling approach uh, for cars or for trucks. And this is, uh, again, the, uh, the, the results uh, of, our, of our findings. So... You know, my um, my high school English teacher always said, when you go to a presentation, you got to tell them what you're going to tell them, then you tell them, then you tell them what you told them. So this we're starting here with the summary, right? This, and we'll get into the details here. But the punchline is, is that five of the six market participants, these P3 firms that we talked to, stated that uh, a public-private partnership delivery model is really not a suitable solution for the challenges that you all are facing on I-81. And, and we'll get into the details as to why. Um, you know, the chair mentioned that, you know, we're trying to look at all different options and we asked the market to do that as well. They looked at just adding a lane and making that lane a tolled lane. So the similar to the express lanes that you see in Northern Virginia, they also looked at what if you were to toll, toll all the lanes, right? So they looked at a wide variety of options. Um, and what, uh, what they said was, look, we're the private sector. If you really want to pay us, and uh, we'll come in and do it, but we don't think it's going to really accelerate delivery of the projects that much faster. We don't think it's all that efficient, and we think it might be overkill for the types of problems you're you're experiencing. And again, we can get into all of those details. Um, all of those solutions, though, would require charging a user fee or toll. 
um, and they would require a significant additional contribution from the Commonwealth in terms of either taxes um, or other subsidy that would need to be provided um, in addition to the tolls that the traveling public would have to pay. Um, so uh, we took a look at all the information that we got in this market discussion. We had back and forth with the market players, conversations, and then uh, we independently assessed it. Um, and a few things that we want folks to know is that this information is helpful, but it's quite early on. And so it's preliminary and high level. Um, we think that in particular, the private sector's assumptions on the capital costs were pretty low and that uh, the revenue expectations that they were sharing were pretty rosy. Um, so we think ultimately that what you'll see here in terms of what their initial assessments were um, are a little aggressive and that, um, that the uh, reality will be a little bit more, a lot more expensive for them um, and uh, that their toll revenues may not be as great as they were initially expecting. I'm going to see if I can pick the right button here. Hey, there it is. Okay. As Sasha mentioned, the market sounding, this is a common tool used in the public-private partnership world. You go out to the market, you get their feedback early on um, as to what do they think. There's Q&A that goes back and forth, um, and you have, a, you have a discussion, and this allows them to give you some feedback. We talked to six firms. These are some of the best firms in the industry, and they're the players here in the United States, including some who are active in Virginia. Um, and we did this earlier this year. So some of this information is a little dated, just given that we're in October now. Um, we wanted to understand feasibility, and we wanted to understand, based on the I-81 program that you all have been looking at, when you contrast with that, would a public-private partnership help improve? Would it go faster? Would it go further? Would, you, would it let us jump higher, as it were, Mr. Secretary? Um, we asked them to consider s certain specific scenarios, but, but then we opened it up. We said, look, we want your innovative ideas and concepts and ideas. And so they actually proposed some ideas that we hadn't asked them to consider to make sure we were addressing all the options, Mr. Chair. So we did look at managed lanes, similar to those in Northern Virginia, where you, you add an existing uh, managed lane of traffic that's managed through that fee next to the free general purpose lane. Um, and, and in that, we said, well, let's look at what would you do if you could, if it was a truck only managed lane. We also, as uh, my colleague Sasha mentioned, looked at whether, um, what, what would this look like if you were to go just from Stanton all the way to the northern border? Or what would it look like if you were to do a P3 for the entirety of the stretch from state line to state line? And what happens if you were to add just one lane or, or two lanes in each direction? So we did uh, look at the whole universe of, uh, of options. Um, the firms were provided with all the information that's existing out there, all the information that you can access on the website in terms of um, estimates as well as cost estimates. Um, some of the firms decided to use those cost estimates. Some decided to use their own um, cost estimates. Um, and then we, uh, again, looked at those, assessed those independently based on, on what they looked at. Here you'll see that $35 million a mile number, but you, you've also heard the discussion around the room about you know, it's probably a little bit more than that when you when you take everything into account. Um, some of those firms, uh, as I mentioned, decided to use that cost estimate. So uh, when you look at the numbers, you'll see that, that they're based on that. I'll go to the next slide here. In the interest of time, I'll hand it back over to Sasha. OK, so here on this on the slide, you see a summary of what the participants said. And remember, these are six uh, firms that put this together. Um, and not all of them provide information on each segment or each type of um, arrangement. Um, so I think it's important to just keep in mind that this is high level uh, data. We think in general, as, as Dave was saying, it, it makes sense, but they're somewhat aggressive. They are, of course, in a bit of a marketing mode. On the other hand, they are long term partners in this industry and, and also in, in, in Virginia. Uh, so their assumptions. Um, as, as you'd expect in any type of uh, survey like this, differ in terms of toll rates, in terms of cost, in terms of the, the speed that they can achieve to uh, build, build these facilities. And, and again, these are high level. They did this on their own dime. They did this over approximately a six to 10 week uh, period. Um, so as you see in the first example here, the 102 mile segment, um, they the the range uh, of of costs was um, up to 2.6 billion dollars for this 102 miles all lanes toll. That's 
putting uh, uh, toll lanes from the beginning of, of that segment, so everyone has to pay a toll, trucks and cars. And as you understand, um, that is a, a low price relatively, uh, uh, it's lower than the other options because everyone has to pay. Um, and the, um, the costs of building three lanes, actually adding additional lane are lower than adding a managed lane where you have to have separate exits and, and entrances uh, as, as you, you can see in, in Northern Virginia. So that's, that's one range here. The second is managed lanes. Um, which uh, are 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 higher, uh, significantly higher, and these are to to be clear, these are the additional costs in addition to tolls, in addition to the assumption of uh, the Commonwealth paying a billion dollars for these five widening projects, which uh, the 102 miles encompass. So it's an additional cost uh, as well as as tolls. Uh, so the 102 mile managed lane um, estimates are significantly higher. Um, and, and the reason, of course, is the fact that, that trucks or cars don't have to use these lanes. They have the option, and they will only use it when there's truly congestion. Um, and while, while there is a lot of traffic, it's not uh, uh, 24 hours. So they will make that economic decision. Therefore, there's a need for greater subsidy. For the 325-mile option, um, the costs are obviously much more substantial between 12 and 13 billion if you're looking at trucks or um, a managed lane for cars. And that obviously makes sense as discussion is, uh, this is a long uh, segment and, and these costs are, are very high. So there's a lot of ranges here. Uh, I think the key message uh, that we feel makes sense is that these will be expensive and these are done in a fairly professional way, high level, however. Um, so these are costs that are going to be, as we've discussed previously, at, at least what 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 is on here, and probably given our uh, you know a rough estimate, it's going to be more expensive than 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 what they have already uh, said. But nevertheless, I think this makes sense, and uh, it does give you a feel for their their response. So we talked a little about how much does it cost. Let's talk a little bit about how long would it take. Um, uh, a P three alternative would would begin much later. Then the construction you're going to start seeing out in the on the corridor uh, starting real soon, um, up to four years later, and I'll talk about why. And it would end later than uh, the existing uh, I-81 improvements would end. Um, the reason for this is that in order to do any sort of P3 with tolling, you have to get go through a number of different additional processes that you don't have to go through currently with the the current plan. Um, any tolling authority has to be approved by the General Assembly. So whether it's managed lanes or all lanes tolling, that would have to go through that process. There would have to be additional uh, federal environmental uh, approval processes, so the NEPA process for folks. And, and if anybody's worked with NEPA before, you know that doesn't go quickly, it goes slowly. So that would have to be added in. Um, and then you would have to do a procurement. Any procurement has to go through a public procurement process. Those procurement processes take at least 18 months sometimes up to uh, up to longer so you wouldn't really get under construction in a in a public private partnership scenario until around 2028 as best estimate um public private partnerships are good however at truncating the time as dave was talking about in design build you get efficiencies from bundling the design phase and the construction phase similarly you gain additional efficiencies when you're designing you're constructing and you're layering in all the projections for operations, maintenance, et cetera. So the phase of construction would be a little bit uh, shorter, uh, at least according to these firms in terms of uh, building out the improvements. Um, but again, compared to the existing timeline, which is on the bottom half of the screen there, that's uh, VDOT's uh, Improve I-81 um, program, uh, it would finish later and start later. And, and then there's all the uh, the fine print. So we're not lawyers, but we, we do work with this kind of um, in this industry. And a lot of this is uh, dictated by statute and rules and regulations. Uh, as I noted, any tolling solution requires a bunch of additional uh, processes, both at the Commonwealth level as well as the federal level. Um, the General Assembly approval that we discussed. Federal law uh, imposes restrictions on just slapping a new toll on existing free uh, interstate highways. And so you have to go through um, uh, one of a couple or a few different federal processes to get authority to do that. 
Um, we also uh, looked at, and I, I think I mentioned briefly, we had the firms look at, well, what could you just toll trucks in the corridor? We all know this is a heavy truck, uh, a corridor used by trucks frequently. Um, there have been a few jurisdictions that have tried this. Currently, uh, Rhode Island is the most recent. They've tried it, and when they turned on their system, it was challenged in court. Uh, federal court in uh, Rhode Island uh, viewed this as unconstitutional. Not sure where that goes, but right now the decision is you can't do it. So um, there's that hurdle too if you were going to look at only truck tolling. Um, and then the, the 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 bottom bullet point here just sort of summarizes what we've been discussing, which is the. Uh, beginning of construction um, would uh, not start for quite some time, probably until 2028 or so, compared to the existing I-81 uh, corridor improvements plan. Let's go on to, I think, the final summary. So, so I'll hand it back off to Sasha to tie this all up together, and then we we'll are be happy to uh, take any questions that anyone's got. Great. So uh, to conclude, I think it's pretty clear from from our analysis and what we heard from the the market that um, these uh, types of uh, uh, P3 approaches will take uh, state and federal to uh, tolling authorization if we pursue a um, uh, tolling for all three lanes. Um, in general, the market did not recommend managed lanes as a solution for these projects. Um, as David explained, the P3 process does take additional time. Uh, especially for the NEPA work and to a certain extent for the procurement as well. Uh, and I think uh, as, as the numbers I hopefully showed in the, um, in, in the, the previous um, estimates, the uh, solutions will require additional public funding in addition to tolls and the current uh, grants that are and, and funding that is expected to be used for the I-81 project. So again, to reiterate what we've said, we don't think, and I think the market also says, really P3s do not make sense for this project given the, the current circumstances and the state of where uh, the Commonwealth is in terms of uh, developing its, its its project. So if you look at all, ten, all lanes tolling, if you look at the, the options there, really the, the issue is the federal and state approval process is really a barrier. Managed lanes, difficult to imagine managed lanes being economic um, because of lack of recurring congestion for cars. For trucks, uh, uh, it's it's a challenge, as David explained. For the um, in terms of regulatory issues, there's regulatory barriers uh, to tr to uh, toll uh, trucks only, and and there's an additional um, uh, thought that you actually may need to have two truck lanes to really make them effective. So I think this would uh, leave, leave us to to conclude that this is not not the right solution at, at this time. Happy to answer any questions. Okay, any questions? Yes, Delegate Wiley. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Going back to your slide um, with how much it would cost, you had truck, the one with the truck and then the cars. The bottom numbers were throwing me off. I'm just curious. I would think that the truck lane would be more expensive to make, would it not? Uh, so two, two things again, uh, these are high level um, numbers. And uh, two is that uh, with trucks, given the congestion and the value of time of a typical professional truck driver, um, they would be willing to take a managed lane um, more than a typical driver because their typical driver is both commuter and, a, and, a, and, a, and a, using for commercial, uh, for, for personal uh, uh, driving. I think where I'm going with the question is, is the weight of a truck in terms of the specs of building the road, wouldn't the, wouldn't the, the road itself be more or constructed heavier for that type of truck weight? Is it or is it not? They kind of the same. Stupid question. Sorry, Mr. Chairman. The road would be built to be able to handle both the both. automobile and the truck at the same time. Okay. So, so going to your one, 12 billion versus the 13 billion, why are they different? That's the case, Mr. Mr. Chairman. The Delegate Wiley, this is what this chart is showing is the required public subsidy that would be required okay. to be able to assist it. The, as Sasha indicated, the value of time associated with a commercial motor vehicle can generate more revenue than what would come from a passenger car. Got it. And so that's the offsetting okay. difference between the required public subsidy. Okay, thank you. Uh, Sasha and David, I think uh, 
I have a question. Uh, you know, I've had this, I had the privilege of having this presentation earlier and I've had time to think about it a little bit, but uh, based on this, this graph here with 102 miles and, and for everyone's knowledge, the reason we looked at 102 miles, that, that was roughly from the interstate 64, I-81 interchange at Stanton to the West Virginia line. And what brought this concept about for consideration was over that duration and length, we had currently an I-81 plan allocated about $698 million, if my memory reminds me correctly, of dollars to be expended. So I was looking at if we use those dollars to buy down this cost, how effectively could this be? And so now if we go back to this plan of, of necessary investment of the Commonwealth of $4.2 billion, and then we go to the, your project uh, projected project timeline. Could you put that slide up, please, David? Okay, there. On this slide, if based upon what I just said, if we were to begin planning of a P3 in 2024 for one lane managed, if I'm reading that correctly, that would conclude or complete by 2031. Is that correct, David? Uh, Mr. Chair, this top graph here is for all lanes tolling. And the reason that was used is because okay. that was for, that was, of all the P3 alternatives that were considered by the market, this was the one they thought might make the most sense for the corridor. But there's a bottom not for one lane tolling? No. The bottom is current VDA I-81 improvement program. We might be getting confused. Oh, okay. Because the, that's, that's fine. That's fine. To, I believe when we started this process back in January, yes. we thought it was 2031, and now we've pulled some things back and added some things to the program. It's now 2033. So let's go back to the top. Certainly you could design and contractually commit yourself through a contract at the top timeline of 2028 to 2034 being complete over the 102 mile corridor. Now, having said that, if we're going to invest $4.6 billion and we have 600, we had 698 million, then we've got $4 billion to invest. But in today's real money and the fact that our money is going to run out and we're only going to have $300 million beginning in 2035, we would have been complete this work by 2035. So that, that is my concern here with the continued rising rise of cost and, and the continued not knowing where the dollars are going to come from going forward. I mean, I don't know where we get the $4 billion to do uh, the the upfront delivery of funds to get the project started, 4.2 billion or 3.8, if we use the, four, the 600 million or 700 million, 3.5. Um, but you know that's my concern. We could have been complete the 102 miles by 2034 if we had if we were to consider this approach. Not that we won't going forward, and, but it, it just seemed to me that with the uncertainties going forward and where the revenue is going to come from and how we're ever going to accomplish the mission, at some point we're going to have to bite the bullet and Mr. move forward with a plan. Mr. Chair, if I may, just to clarify please, one item please. on the screen. So yes, sir, and that's correct. The the one thing I'll note here is again, this is what the market's telling us. They're telling us it's about a, from 2028 to 2034 construction period for 102 miles, all lane tolling in each direction. So now you're talking about adding additional lane. We think that's highly optimistic. If you look at some of the current projects that VDOT's uh, undergoing for adding an express lane, for example, I-66 outside the Beltway, uh, Mr. Commissioner, refresh my memory. That's uh, 20, the, the 23 miles. 23 miles in one and, direction. In one so, direction, and that's taken four to five years of estimated construction and delivery. Here we're talking about 102 miles. So, to Sasha's point, the market's reputable. They want to come work for the Commonwealth, and they're, um, but they're also might be uh, putting a little rosy estimate in terms of how long it might take. Yeah, fair enough. Fair enough. All right. I just wanted to show that analogy. That was, that's what's concerned me that the completion, the timeline and having the ability to complete a lane in each direction by tentatively around 2034. And, and the fact that the delivery cost is only going to continue to grow. I mean, it's, that's not going to get any less. Uh, you know, if we were to make the monetary contribution of three and a half billion dollars, uh, Tentatively, we could have a lane in each direction by that timeline. 
Mr. Commissioner, you act like you want to say something. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. You've been quiet. He's sitting on the edge of his chair there. <laughs> so, go ahead. Mr. Mr. Chairman, I, I'd say David David beat me to the punch. The, the, this is an extremely aggressive timeline to be able to construct 102 miles in each direction in challenging terrain. I do think that the example of 66 taking about five years that it is based upon a 23 miles. This is almost five times that length that I do think that that we can get portions of it finished within said time frame. But the amount of resources that would be available to be able to deliver 102 miles in each direction, let's face it, we had about 1,500 to 2,000 people on 66 on any given day for 23 miles. I don't think that the resources are there if we stopped all the other projects in the Commonwealth and focused on 81 we would get get it within this time frame. And, and I do think that this is very aggressive, not only the, the construction time frame, but also the revenue forecast that, that they're bringing in is, I think the lead in that both Sasha and David said was, this is, we are very early in on this stage. They are aggressive in their numbers today. And if we were to move it forward, we would hone in and I would I would dare to say that these numbers and timelines would would begin to get elongated very quickly. With all due respect, Mr. Commissioner, I don't doubt that. But if we add 10 years to that, we then have 204 miles of third lane added. Yes, sir. Or in today's world, by the 2034, essentially, we're going to have 87 lane miles in Virginia. When we complete all the current planned projects, now, I respect it. I respect the study. I think it's very well done. I think it's worthy. But I, I think I'm looking for a means by which to make further ground, cover further ground in a in some timely matter. And I think the costs are only going to escalate. Only you're ever going to get any less. And I think uh, the truck volume is increasing. We all know that. So it's a challenge. It's a real challenge. But I, I respect the fact that I agree. I don't know that we could, it could be done in that timeline. So, okay, go ahead. Any other questions? Anyone have any questions? I'm sorry. Phil? Mr. Yes, sir. Yeah. Mr. Chair, just to echo your sentiments, unless I'm mistaken, uh, the lady who presented for the co Commonwealth with VDOT, uh, you didn't have any escalation on the construction cost in your modeling. Is that correct? No, sir. So with the delivery dates that um, Mr. Covington provided earlier today, we inflate those to the year of delivery and the expected construction duration. So they are inflated. Yes, they sir. are inflated. Okay. Because I was going <laughs> to suggest if they're not, we've got to get them inflated by no other model except using a Kager. You've, you've got to have that realistic picture. But this is more challenging, I think, cost-wise than what we've got on the table. <laughs> And so with that said, you know, I'd like to see it get done sooner too, but I don't think that's going to happen, um, Mr. Yeah. Chair. But at the same time, I don't think the citizens are going to want to pay tolls on 81, never mind the truckers. No one today has asked this question, what can Congress do for us? Because this is an interstate highway system. And by the way, most of the traffic coming through the Commonwealth is coming from out of state through the state. It's all interstate truck traffic for the most part. And, you know, they built the highway system, interstate highway system, but we've got a problem here if we want to get it done sooner without costing the state all this future money. And I, I don't want to anger the taxpayers with a toll. And I'm not so sure that would, we'd all be sitting here if, if that was the case and we were advocating for that. Because even though it is an alternative, I think these folks here today kind of laid out the, in their summary in the beginning what that uh, it's not really suitable. Mr. North, I don't I don't know that I have any anything that really helps, but um, you know I had not been a particularly um, strong advocate for tolling in Virginia in my history. Um, and I sort of came to the conclusion as I got into this job that um, I could 
personally sort of get past that if it was new stuff, right? I couldn't get it another way. So could I get it? Could I get the new thing by tolling? Either get it by tolling or I don't get it. And so I've sort of come around to the, the to the expansion and the and the new the new opportunity that it's that it's it's better than not getting it because I don't have to take it. And if, as long as I'm not paying for it, if I don't take it, then why do I care? That's sort of what I came to. In this case, um, that's what we're talking. If we do all lane, I mean, all lane tolling is not going to happen on anyone. We we know that. Might as well just take that off the thing. Not going to happen for lots of reasons. Um, but if we added additional lanes, could we toll those? Well, right now we're going to add a lot of, we're going to add a, a, a fair amount of improvement and there will be no toll on it. If we go the other way, we're going to take that billion that we already spent and add the 4.2 or whatever the number might be. And then we would also have a toll. And I can't tell you what the toll is really because it's managed and it's all, it's all a matter of how many people want to pay it. And that's an individual decision informed by how much traffic you have, right? So all those estimates are made, but at the end of the day, that's what we do in these managed lanes. We decide, and I think, not to get you excited, but I think the, the highest toll we've had in a managed lane in Virginia happened a couple, well, maybe last week. Last week? Inside the Beltway, we 57 reached $57.75. $57. Dollars went to and that was to keep traffic moving at 45 miles an hour or higher. That's what it manages to. So I, I agree with you, sir. Um, and I agree with the chairman and his, his concern and his angst. At the end of the day, we're, we're just saying, where else can we go? What's the best? That's why we went through this drill. Where else could we go? What are we, what stones not, um, what's not, what stones not been turned over? What thing have we not thought about? What can we possibly do? So that's why we cast the net so broadly. And the answer is there's a bunch of stuff we can do, but it comes with a cost, whether that's a tolling cost, whether that's a general fund, you know, money or, or some other pot of money. Um, I still believe, and I hope I'm right, and I won't be in this job. So, you know, when, when this concludes, um, I truly believe that the impact of all this suite of projects that y'all have approved and that are funded are going to have a substantial impact on what the motorist sees. And I just keep dragging you back to the $200 million. We're at three point whatever billion dollars it is, and we spent $200 million. <coughs> And so it, we're not feeling it yet. Now, that's not going to help the chairman's problem of 15 years from now. I understand that. And that's continuing to go. Um, and, and the federal government, you know, okay. <laughs> You know, okay. Um, so we're dedicated to find a way if there's one that's that is findable, and we'll continue to do that and push um, as we have. We just, you know, we're just we're, we're, we're caught between uh, a revenue stream and a desire. I think we'll meet in the middle and we'll be okay, at least in the in the short to middle term, in the next ten or twelve years. But obviously, it continues to the, 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 the problem doesn't stop. I use the illustration about '95, and you know we're getting to Fred. We got to Fredericksburg. Well, it's already backing up. You know, it's already like okay, how much further can you go? And it just, we just keep doing it. So, it's Phil, it's Phil, let me say, when we met with the governor, we didn't ask for an, a, an all tolling lane solution. The committee met and said we want to look at a managed lane solution. Yeah. The two right lanes would remain free travel. The third lane to relieve congestion would be a managed lane. PDOT themselves said, let's look at the scenario from an all lane or a single lane. Um, nobody was encouraging. We just nobody, didn't, we wanted to look at everything. Nobody was encouraging. But what we have to, and, and the third lane would be a land lease from the Commonwealth for a period of time, 50 years or something, and they would maintain that lane. VDOT would not have to maintain that lane, and we could buy down the tolls if necessary over time if there were tolls that we wanted to buy down, depending on how that revenue collect was coming in. But, you know, there, we, we've got to be open-minded and investigate all options and look for solutions. To, to If you know the $35 million per mile number is going to continue to grow, and we're talking about just completing what we have revenues for by 2034. 
I'm talking about after that time. So we need to be open-minded and look for suggestions and solutions. And, and I tell you, I pretty much run out of solutions because the, the dollar, the $35 million per mile number is just, it's, it's overwhelming. And, and, uh, but it is realistic. Go out there and buy some equipment, pay the labor costs, <clears throat> and work at night with the lack of your production goes down. It's understandable how it's $35 million a mile. I don't say that, that, that people aren't charging an adequate cost per mile. It's just that that number's not getting any less, and we're not making much progress here. I totally agree, and I, I don't think there's so, anything wrong with looking at all different modes. And I'm glad that this mode was looked at today because it gave us a different cost comparison to what our plan is today. And I do think that by 2033, we'll make a lot of progress because it seems like to me we're just ratcheting up here with what, what we're going to accomplish over the next uh, a period of time between now and 2033. Let, let me tell you this, and I came from the railroad industry, and the railroad is not an all solutions cure for this, but you can build a mile of double track a whole lot cheaper than $34 million. And while it won't take all the trucks off of the interstate highway, it will take some of the trucks off. I did some calculations. You could probably put on two intermodal trains a day in each direction, and it would take some of the truck pressure off, along with what we're also doing now with our current plan through 2033. I'm sitting here wondering the same thing as you are. I'm looking at the fuel prices. And while I'm glad to hear that those calculations didn't figure to go down like some people had been chatting about, and they're going to remain escalated to some point going forward. Um, that's good news. But you know, I leave this. I leave this question for the for the commission. Have we discussed with Norfolk Southern or CSX about building additional track capacity in the Commonwealth to help with this problem? And then it extends even beyond that with the states north of us as well as south of us, because. Uh, we've got a new river. Um, I think Bristol's got funding for a tr for a truck uh, terminal down there. Uh, intermodal yard. Intermodal yard, just like we have north of us here. I mean, there's there's a solution where the trucks can come there, get put on trains that are built out going north. Uh, it would also take into uh, consideration reducing the wear and tear on the bridges, because I think we've all seen how the bridges need attention too, and are being given attention up and down the Commonwealth. So. Yeah. So that's well, my, my comment on a different alternative. West well. Rock and Covington is the largest, or was, they may not be today, but they were the largest exporter out of the Port of Virginia. And I've tried and tried to look at, uh, at an intermodal yard in that area so we could put their product on a train. And when it got, when mm -hmm. we got right down to it, the time to get the product between Covington and the, and the port just did not meet their schedule. There was no way with the with the rail uh, as with the uh, not just that, but time based deliveries in areas. Also, it's just tough to get trains to deliver products as trucks do today. So, you know, yeah. You railroad will never comments? the railroad will never compete with the trucks. It just extends the supply chain, and you can build that into your modeling. It's just the it's a small suggestion for a large problem in terms of getting the fix. I agree. I don't disagree with your point. Yeah, I just want to clarify that only truck lane, in addition with Mr. Chairman uh, stated, was for vehicles only, not trucks. And I also want to ask um, Mr. Secretary, and considering this is a public meeting, is this shareable now? Can we share this to our public? I had some folks yeah, asking on, about it. will be on the site. OK, thank you. Uh, I'm not sure what you were, what you were talking about. The, uh, uh, the lane differentiation. You were it was my about. understanding that the single lane we started with was passenger a, was passenger vehicles only. It was That's basically right. a hot lane. Yeah, yeah we, we managed we, hot lane. In the cornucopia of things, we, we looked at everything. Right. No, we I'm just saying that the only one we had right. beginning, we started with the one. And, and let me and not and not to to um to take issue with the chairman, but when you manage a lane, right, the ability to buy down the toll. There's not a mechanism because when you manage the lane, the toll varies depending on the demand. And so, like when we man when we buy down the toll at ERC, there's a peak price and there's an off peak price, and there's a user that has an income, particular income. 
and we know how many times they use it, and we can actually rebate the number based on that's the toll. But your toll on these things could be anywhere from three dollars to forty-five dollars, and it just uh, you can't you can't rebate it the same way, so it gets harder to do so. At the end of the day, I mean, what he said is is accurate. The other thing I would I would just tell you, and these guys have told you this a couple of times. We ask these <laughs> folks to be um, realistic, but understand they're selling something here, right? And when we looked at the number of bridges that we have to deal with going north on 81, there are a lot of bridges. And there are all sorts of issues with the third lane and a lot of those bridges that likely we don't think have been taken into consideration. So my point is, th this number is not going to get better. It just doesn't work like that. It never does. This number that we're showing is going to get worse. How much? Well, to the chairman's point, inflation is going to make it somewhat worse. But how much? Th this is the bottom, right? So just to be clear, we think this is the bottom. And it's an aggressive bottom in some cases. And so as we look at these things, just understand that's what we're dealing with. And we want a solution that gets it there faster and gets it there better. That's what we're searching for. Thank you. Any, Any other questions? questions? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Sasha. Thank you, David. Thank you. Appreciate it. Okay. Now we'll move to, uh, are there any comments or discussions at this point that hasn't been discussed <laughs> by the committee? Okay. Hearing none. We'll now move to public comment. We have someone, Eric, and I'm not sure of the last name. Shahar, possibly. Say Shaw. Sorry. Say Shaw. Say Shaw. Say Shaw. Okay. Hey, good afternoon, um, Delegate Austin, Chairman Austin. Thank you very much. Secretary Miller, I appreciate you being here down in beautiful Southwest Virginia, and good to see some familiar faces, Delegate Ballard and Supervisor North from Roanoke County. I um, really just wanted to really mention two things just on smart scale. So Roanoke Regional Chamber of Commerce, I'm Eric Sischow, President and CEO. You know, we advocate daily on a lot of different issues, um, and certainly we take stands on issues, don't take stands on, on people. Um, and one of those pillars that we have is transportation. So we're fighting every day for not just funding on 81, but other transportation projects. So really appreciate the thoughtful discussion and the thoughtful consideration with everything. Um, specifically, you know, we mentioned the, the 116 to 128 corridor on uh, on I-81, and that's such an important corridor. Um, and with that being said, just some of the changes to smart scale, um, you know, from the chamber's perspective, we just want to make sure that the guardrails are put in place so that Southwest Virginia and Roanoke um, and the region are not unintentionally left behind, um, and just make sure that that's the thoughtful discussion that's happening today is continuing to happen when it comes to those changes for smart scale. And that continues to be a concern that we're keeping an eye on. So I applaud this group and others. Um, Secretary Miller, certainly your comments last week at the Virginia Chamber event, really appreciated that as well. And then really just want to reiterate our support and the importance for that three laning. Certainly as we reiterated for exits 116 to 128, it's important for both the northbound and the southbound to be fully funded into the future, certainly exits 137 to 141. I know I personally noticed the difference of how those changes have made an impact. Uh, exits 143 to 150, again, another important corridor. And really just from the chamber's perspective, just want to thank you all for your support. Um, appreciate the opportunity to speak. Thank you, Eric. Anyone else? Mr. Soder, Spencer Soder, please come forward. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, Mr. Secretary, members of the committee, um, I know Delegate Austin and uh, Mayor Friedman know that I never miss an opportunity to talk about Rockbridge County. So um, real briefly, and I will be brief, um, thank you for everything that you've done and you continue to do in these meetings. Um, and really, our, our main focus here in Rockbridge is three-laning the shared interstate. I-64. I-64 and I-81, um, and we share that with Augusta County, and I know they feel the same way too. I don't know if anybody's here from Augusta, but uh, again, being brief, the the safety factor of that 
um, and the truck climbing lanes on either end are critical to us. Thank you. Yeah, and Spencer, while you're there, I will say that uh, in my travels back and forth to Richmond on Sunday evenings, oftentimes Interstate 81 is backed up to Route 60, and it's because of the left-hand merge of 64 off onto I-81 East, and uh, it just backs up traffic. So, you know, that is something that we've got to look at to get to that hill, uh, the, the climbing lanes to get to the three lanes just north of Lexington for that continuation. So. Hey. Uh, Agreed, and it may it may not look like it, but there is a there is an incline on to 81, and that is a significant problem. Uh, and even worse is on the other end at the Timber Ridge end at the next exit, coming south. Uh, that's that's driving straight up a hill onto 81. It creates a tremendous backup. And then if uh, if everything lined up in the future, if we could three lane all the way down to <coughs> Buffalo Creek and just pull all of it together, I know we don't have unlimited money, but I told my chair I'd advocate for that too. <laughs> thank you, thank, thank you, you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Uh, County Administrator. We thank you, Spencer, for what you do. <laughs> thank you for hosting us here today in Rockbridge County. We appreciate it. Okay, uh, at this time, I'll entertain any closing remarks from any members of the commission. Anyone have anything that they'd like to say? Uh, yes, Mayor. I'll, just, I'll right. just observe from the conversation here today, I'm thrilled <clears throat> that this group is advocating for progress, not perfection, looking at all the options to move forward uh, systematically and strategically to get the, the best outcome, especially uh, Spencer mentioned for safety, but also for um, uh, economic development throughout our Commonwealth. So, and thank you all for uh, choosing our community to host this meeting. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mr. Secretary, you have anything you'd like to say? Thank, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, let me just say this. If there's anybody that doesn't understand the passion and and the, and the hard work that the chairman has put towards this, um, tell them to give, I'll, I'll give you my number and I'll give you some more on that. Um, he has been a tireless pusher um, and has pushed us very hard in the proper way to try to find ways to make this better. And um, we're committed to do that. We're transparent as we can possibly be. We'll look at anything and everything. Um, and we're just we're just trying to advance it faster and make it better. And that's our goal while still keeping it safe and and um and keeping the money in control. So um we we just we're just here trying to trying to do the, the, what we can to, to to get to that goal. And he's been a, a strong advocate for this uh for this road in this area. Thank you, Mr. Secretary and the Commissioner and the VDOT staff. Uh in its entire I'm sorry. Mark, go ahead. Um, just on um, Ms. Farmer's presentation had the five projects that were next to be considered. And I know that there are, we just heard about 64, 81. Could, I don't want to belabor today's meeting, but at the future meeting, could we discuss the process that will be followed about how those projects will be prioritized along with other projects that have been identified by the districts that were part of the original 124, 132, whatever it was. Yes. And, and uh, Mark, as a member of the CTB, you, you know, and I'm sure you understand that this committee um, is, is formed to look at options and look at scenarios and to make recommendations to the CTB who will make the ultimate decisions. But certainly we'll be looking at those projects and trying to prioritize in a form of a recommendation to the CTB what this committee's benefits, as we see, would be to those to the CTB. So thank you. And, and now back, Mr. Mr. Secretary and, and, and the Commissioner um, and the Chief Engineer and all of VDOT staff has focused, uh, laser focused on I-81. They understand the growth in the transportation, um, the trucks and the cars. Uh, we currently have about a four to one, four cars to every one truck ratio on Interstate 81. I don't think we have that on any other interstate system in Virginia in proportionality, but uh, it's huge. But, and so we all, from today's work, we all see we're investigating options every day. We're looking for anything that's possible to advance and move the ball up the field a little bit. But we have challenges, as we all know. There's just not enough rent revenue in the Highway Transportation Trust Fund. We've done things to improve that. We now have a sustainable fund on I-81 that we didn't have prior to 2019 legislation. But we've got to keep working. I mean, we're only going to get there if we all work lock arms and work together to try to accomplish this. And even with that, it's going to be a tremendous challenge. But I thank the commission, your, everyone's work, 
everything you do. And with that, do I have a motion to adjourn? So moved. I have a motion. Second. And we're stand adjourned. Thank you.